Um, mate, let's go back to where it all began. You were born in Dalby and you grew up Dalby? in... Yep, Dalby. 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 Yeah, sorry. And you grew up in Toowoomba. Yeah. Um, so it was the Newtown, Newtown Lions that you played with? Uh, yeah, I did, yeah. And you mentioned before, they, they went through a bit of a lean period, but I heard a story that you're the one that got them back up and running again recently. Oh, no, I didn't. Well, there's um, there's a uh, sort of a committee or a group of people who, um, former players and and partners and, and you know, probably kids of parents who are involved in the club um, who are now adults who really wanted to get the club up and going again. And so they just gave me a call and said, you know, would you jump on board with us? So I definitely haven't done any of the work that they've done, they've been doing all of the, you know, all of the really hard lifting. Um, and I've tried to do as much as I could from afar, if I can sort of say. They've asked me to be the ambassador. So um, we had um, a season launch at the start of this year. I went up up to Toowoomba for that and, um, and I had a sign-on day. I went out, went out to that. And, yeah, it's really good to see the club going again, mate. Um, yeah. It's really sad when the club wasn't there. As I said, just a few names off the top of the top of the head before, you know, one of the people asked me about the greatest coaches coach that I've ever had. And I'd probably say there's three or four of them, and they're all probably my junior coaches. And the reason why I say those guys rather than Wayne Bennett or Steve Folks or Chris Anderson or Mal Meninga is because they're so um, influential. I, I, as building you as a young man. Yep. Um, the guys like Bill Pollard and Arthur Wrigley and Greg Platts and those sort of guys are guys that I'll never, ever forget and gave me so much. Um, we all had the same, you know, interest, which is rugby league, but they knew that to be a good young man is most important. And so they trained, they, they trained all of those traits into us, like, you know, ethics and being ethical and humble and, and disciplined and, you know, a hard worker and, and all of that type of thing through our football. Um, and there's a whole heap of guys that sort of came through, the Doonan brothers, who Ian's my yeah. age. Yeah. Played, um, NRL, Andrew um, played NRL as well, um, who Ian was in my team. Um, we had a whole heap that come through sort of all at the same time. And I was, I truly believe it's a big, big heads up to the coaches that you have at a young age. They can really have a huge impact on you. And everyone who's listening will be able to know in their own life how much of an impact. And the, the thing I love about it the most is it's not necessarily to be a great NRL player. It was just to be a good person. Yeah. And, and to be a good citizen in the community. And, um, and that's something that I'll, you know, when I got enough Origin jerseys, I gave those guys a jersey each because of how much of an impact that had on my life and the person I became, um, you know, and, and all of my mates. Like, I was really proud to get into the NRL when I got there and I felt as though I was playing for all the boys that I grew up with because yep. we all wanted to be there and we'd all play in the backyard and we all had that same dream. But unfortunately, we all couldn't be there. And... Um, and I sort of felt as though that as well, that those guys would be sitting back and you know, feeling pretty good about themselves that they had such an impact on a young man to know that, you know, they played a part, played a role. Uh, it was, it was pretty cool. So, yeah, um, I, I, so I was born in Dalby. My, my mum and dad had a trailer building business, Price's Trailer Sales. Uh, we went bankrupt in um, 1980, 1981. I was five or six. Um, we moved from Dolby to, to Brisbane. We moved to Acacia Ridge. Mum and Dad split up. And then Mum met my now stepfather, Gary, and we moved to Toowoomba um, in about 83. And uh, a guy at school, I was playing soccer before then. I'm playing all sorts of sports. But a guy at school said, why don't you come and play league? And I went along to train with him and um, whilst he was in my, my, my year at school, he was actually a year older than me. So I couldn't actually play in his team. Oh. And uh, I was almost not going to do it. 
And mum said, why don't you just go and meet the guys who are your age? And so there you go. And so I went over there and, yeah, it was amazing. Like, we're all still really good mates these days. Ian was one of them, Ian Dunerman. And we had a really successful sort of junior period with some great coaches. And and then obviously schoolboy and um, all the rep sites in the juniors. Darling Downs, Tournament Southwest is a really strong rugby league area. So, again, had really good coaches and played with, like, you know, Webby, Shane Webke's my age. He's from Allera. Um, played Darling Downs schoolboys with him under 12s. Um, he was on the bench and he was exactly um, the way he was in the NRL. He was the same. He was rough and tumble and just gave absolutely everything. And uh, he just worked out, you know, um, how important rugby league was to him as he got older and um, went on and had a magnificent career. So Wayne, uh, our under-18s coach at Newtown, Graham Tucker, was really good friends with Wayne Bennett. And he asked Wayne to come and watch me play in our grand final. And uh, so he came up and watched, and we played Waddles, who Shane Webke played for. And um, it went into overtime, and Waddles won in overtime. And Wayne left that game wanting to sign Shane Webke instead of Steve Price. Uh, Webby always says, you know, that he made the right choice. Uh, he'd always toss it up, Webby, when we'd be in Origin Care. Oh, you know, you made the right choice, Wayne. And Wayne would always say, oh, yeah, I'm still still wondering whether I have shame. And, um, Wayne's take on it, apparently, is that he always felt that I was going to get to Sydney somehow, but Shane wouldn't. And he wanted to, to give a kid like Shane an opportunity that he thought he wouldn't have had. And um, yeah, what a what a great opportunity! Shane made the most of it and was one of my biggest rivals, but also you know a great teammate as well. And really proud of him to have achieved what he achieved from the same area. We we had heard that um, that Wayne yeah. Bennett story. We just didn't know if it was true or not. So uh, well, um, we'd be probably told you. He <laughs> I remember it came out around the time of your Origin debut because they said this time Wayne was able to pick both of you in the team. I just remember right. being in the Courier Mail or something like that. Yeah. 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 How, how did your move to the Bulldogs come about? Um, and how did you find the change moving down to Sydney? Yeah. So um, I was on scholarship with the Gold Coast Seagulls. Oh, um, really? 1990. Yeah, 1990. You were with Camp. Well, you probably was was Campo there then? Campo was there. Uh, I went down and trained a couple of times. I was still at school in Toowoomba and I, Go down, Ian Dunerman, myself, um, Russell Buzzy, and there was about three or four of us. Danny Goddard. That we um, we'd go down and and yeah, Jimmy Goddard was there, Campo, Craig Weston. Um, yeah, I remember all those guys. Yeah. yeah, all those sort of guys were all there. Um, and I was supposed to go down at the end of '91 to the Seagulls and play in the 21s. Yep. Um, 91 come around and they sort of felt as though I was a bit young. So I said, stay up in Toowoomba. Um, I wanted to be a policeman when I was a kid and I didn't get the TE score at the time uh, to go into the police academy because you had to do law as part of your yeah. police academy. So I decided to go back to school, repeat, try and get better marks. Um, and by doing that, we had a really good season footy-wise. And I uh, went to the Queensland uh, trials. Uh, they were at Southport and Peter Moore was there and I must have done something good on the day. Um, he rang my mum and asked whether he could talk to me. I made the Queensland team. He wanted to talk to me in Perth. Got over to Perth, heard that Peter Moore wanted to talk to me. My mum told me. And uh, he didn't say a word to me the whole tournament. And I thought, this guy's full of shit. Like, he wanted to talk to me. He doesn't say a word to me. And we had like um, guys like Anthony Fowler, Matty Singh, um, Brad Thorne. We had all those guys in our team, in our Queensland team. And um, he spoke to Thorny, he spoke to Matty Singh, he spoke to all these guys at his hotel, he never spoke to me. And on the last day, he sort of ran into me and he sort of said, oh, good day, Steve. He goes, mate, you're not going to make the Australian team. Don't get upset about that. You know, he said, uh, it's nothing you've done wrong. I was on the bench for Queensland, so I was probably never going to make the Aussie team anyway. And he just sort of said, keep doing what you're doing and, you know, things will work out for you. And 
sort of thought, oh, okay, that's that's it. <laughs> that's all he wanted to say to me. But um, we then went on to the Commonwealth Bank Cup final. Um, he organised tickets through the Seagulls. He had friends at the Seagulls for my mum. We had a semi-final. Uh, we had a Queensland final at Seagulls. Um, I think we played Palm Beach, Corumban. Yeah. Oh, no, we played, actually, we played Wendell. We played Mackay, St. Pat's. We played Palm Beach the year before. We played um, St. Patrick's Mackay, and they had uh, Wendell Saylor and Dennis Scott um, in their team. And he organised for my mum to go to the game, but through the Seagulls, and the Seagulls didn't know that the tickets were my mum. And I was on scholarship with the Seagulls, but Bullfrog was trying to look good. My mum, and he sent flowers to mum almost daily because um, he had this theory, if you got the mum, you got the kid. Yep. And, uh, yeah, mum just started saying, I think you should go to the Bulldogs. And so you do what your mum says. And crazily, I think Bullfrog might have had a bit to do with this, but in, 20, in, in 1992... Um, Seagulls and the Broncos didn't have under 21s in the New South Wales Rugby League comp. Ah, okay. So that's how I got out of my scholarship because I was supposed to go and play under 21s. Yep. Uh, he basically sent me a letter and all I had to do was sign it to get me out of my scholarship and then sign with the Bulldogs. Um, the Roosters and the Steelers were interested and both of those I'd have to go and do like a trial and that type of thing. Bullfrog got wind of it and he said, if you get injured in those trials, then our contract will be null and void. So mum just said, well, you've got a contract. Go to the Bulldogs. Went yeah. to the Bulldogs. Um, basically, mum wanted to, she, she didn't want me to live with other players. She wanted me to live in a family. So Peter organised a lady who was, um, she was a single lady about mum's age and she lived near the club. And um, she was just in a two-bedroom unit. And he asked her, her name was Colleen Prentice, if she'd take me as a boarder. And um, she said, yep. Yeah. And I flew in. Darren Smith picked me up. I'd never met Darren Smith. But mum said, if there's no one there to pick him up, he's getting on the plane and going home. <laughs> Peter sent Darren Smith. And Smithy wore a headgear, so I never knew what he really looked like. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And we're the only ones left. And I'm going, are you Darren Smith? He goes, you Steve Price. Yeah. <laughs> um, Process of elimination, off. yeah. <laughs> he dropped me off at Colleen's and Colleen thought I was going to have a look to see whether I liked it. Oh. And I thought I was going to have a look to see whether I liked it. But Smithy didn't get the uh, the update communication on that. He's just basically, oh, this is Colleen, Steve. This, you know. He said, all right, guys, I'm going to leave you to it. I'll see you at training tomorrow, Steve. And <laughs> left me the... <laughs> so I uh, stayed with Colleen for two years yep. and it certainly did help um, she cooked for me and um, made me feel as welcome as I could um, stayed out of trouble I uh, found it really hard homesick boys uh, I actually went to Peter once and said I'm really homesick I want to go home and he goes when you first came to the club you said to me one thing what did you say and I said I don't want to go home a loser what I meant by that, I don't want to go home not having given it my best shot. Yep. It wasn't good enough. I could handle that. But if I went home not having a real crack, I didn't want to be one of those guys sitting in the pub going, oh, I used to bash him and I was yeah. so much better than him. So he sort of said to me, I want you to go home. And he said, I'll let you go, but I want you to go home and I want you to have a think about it and then let me know on Monday what, you, what your answer is. So I went home. And I uh, spoke to all the boys and I wanted to be back hanging out with them and they all wanted to be down where I was and I sort of pulled my head in. I didn't like Sydney and I just felt as though, you know, Pete always said, if your career lasts 10 years, that's a long time yeah, in rugby yeah. league and it's not really that much out of your life. So you can live wherever you want if you have a 10-year career. Uh, it's not that much out of your life. So rip in and Dean Pay was at the club at the same time and he actually went home to Dubbo. He got really homesick. So he had a really good talk to me. And another guy called Mark Brockenshire. Yeah, also, yeah. yeah Brocky also had a really good talk to me and that helped. 
And um, I completely changed my attitude about Sydney and completely changed my attitude um, just about where I was at. I was in a very privileged position with a real opportunity to make, you know, dreams come true. So uh, it was a real turner for me. Um, my girlfriend at the time is now my wife. Yep. She was still in Brizzy. So I certainly added to the uh, Telstra profit yeah. at the time. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much every night we'd do the old, you hang up, no, you hang up, and then she hang up. <laughs> and we'd go back and say, what'd you hang up for? <laughs> so it'd be different now. You, you would have been able to FaceTime her. But yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that was, all of those things made it hard. You're probably it living in, but where you were living too, it's probably, you're living in a shit part of Sydney too. Like, Oh, yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hood, man. Oh, no. Where did, uh, uh, did you always live around that area when you played at the Dogs or did you? Yeah, you I did um, yeah. up until the last probably three years. Um, we bought a block of land out of Picton and um, we built out there. So that was going to be my forever house. Yeah. Uh, we did that in 2002. And in 2004, end of 2004, we moved to New Zealand. So yep. <laughs> pretty much there, 18 months. But I uh, really enjoyed living out there. Um, but also, love, you know, did really enjoy living. We lived in Reesby, Belmore, Dulwich Hill, Bankstown, um, Kirawee, Liverpool. Uh, we sort of lived all around. Um, really enjoyed it. It was all very different times of our life. Yeah. Uh, when Joe moved, first moved down, you know, we were battling. I wasn't on much money. She wasn't on much money. So we were, you know, scraping. And we had our first child. And we had our second child and third child. And, you know, um, footy sort of started to get better and better and better. And, yeah, it was always great being in the area. Um, very passionate fans, the Bulldogs fans. I'm a, uh, I'm a Rigsby uh, person myself. I actually lived in Panania, so close yes. to Rigsby. But I was the um, I was the president of the Reesby Heights Footy Club for about seven years, two uh, thousands. Oh. Yeah, so had a big affinity with the uh, Bulldogs. Well, our house in Reesby was Thirty Turvey Street. Tur oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> when we bought the house, I just going, oh, I can't believe this. Yeah. Playing for the Bulldogs and living Turvey Street. Turvey yeah. Street, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, good areas. They are. It is a good area, and you're right. It is. It's a heartland of rugby league, and their 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 fans are really passionate. Really passionate. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, another another childhood dream was about to come true in 1994. I'm guessing, and you make your first grade debut, uh, round 14 at Belmore against the Balmain Tigers. What do you remember about the the lead up to your first grade debut? So, mate, back then um, you play uh, under 21s or reserve grade. And then if everything was going good and you were playing well, Gary Hughes would come and give you a jersey. So then you're off and you'd sit in the bench for first grade. Yep. So there'd be 10 or so guys sitting on the bench for first grade. Two were interchanges and then there'd be another two that would just go on once and stay on. And so we'd have our own bench lotto because there'd be 10 of us sitting there. We'd all put in five bucks each and whoever actually got to go on um, that's sort of how it was, yep. was that you didn't know you were going to be playing. Uh, depending on what happened in the game it would depend on whether you got a game or not. And so my debut, I cannot remember any of that debut. I actually thought my debut was against Manly. Oh, really? <laughs> so <laughs> when, when it said that my debut was against Balmain, um, I've just gone, really? Well, I can't remember that. I remember playing Balmain. <laughs> Uh, in early in my career, but I can't remember my debut. So it would have been one of those times Billy Johnson would have been on the mic and he would have just turned around and said, Pricey, you're on. And I would have been sitting there not listening because I wouldn't have thought I was going to get a run. Yeah. He would have said it again and then he would have just been out there and, and into it. Wow. Um, you played five games that season. Um, and then you find yourself included on the bench for the 94 grand final against Canberra. Um, we've spoken to many of our guests uh, about their first grand final experience. Despite the result, how do you remember the build-up to that that first grand final? Yeah, well, again, uh, I was on the bench. We got beaten, I think, the week before in reserve grade or two weeks before. And so Chris kept us around just in case he wanted to use us. 
So we didn't go to the grand final breakfast. I'm talking about the extended bench. Yep. So the two guys did, which I think was Darren Smith and might have been Mark Brockenshaw or Mitch Newton might have been. Mm. Darren Smith and Mitch Newton, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, uh, those two guys went to the breakfast with uh, the 13, but the others didn't. So all the media were there and we were pretty much just playing kick tennis in the background. Like we were absolute extras that whole week. <laughs> and so, you know, what had happened, Darren Smith had signed with the Broncos and Chris wasn't, I don't think, too happy with that. So, you know, obviously the game went the way it did off the kickoff mm. and um, we don't know if 10 minutes to go or 15 minutes to go. Like I said before, Billy's turned around and said, Pricey, you're on. And I, I've just, I didn't actually hear that because I'm just going, he's not going to say my name. And he yelled it again and I was up and out and racing around like a mad, mad chook on the, uh, on the field. And I, I think I actually did the lap of honour with Canberra. I was so excited, like the family were there. And it was just blowing. I'm just going, this is crazy, like, you know. So I did the lap of honour with Canberra and I got back um, in the dressing room and everyone's really upset and, and down. And I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm jumping out of my skin. I'm going, this is the best thing ever. And you look in a bar and he's like crying and looking at all the boys, they're all so down. I'm going, well, what's going on here? And Bullfrog walked over and he goes, Mate, you never ever want to feel like this again. I go, are you serious? This is awesome. <laughs> and he goes, no. He goes, this is absolutely terrible. I go, whoa. It's not I don't awesome. know why, why are you saying that. He goes, you'll understand. You'll understand. It wasn't until the next year when we won 95 um, and I was yep. able to start and score a try that um, I realised what he was talking about. Um, yeah. You know, winning and losing a grand final is the complete contrast. You know, you almost rather not play in the grand final if you don't win it, which sounds bad, but um, that's how deflating it is and that's how euphoric it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, so I got down there at the end of 92. So 93, didn't play any first grade. 94, I played first grade. 95, I played first grade. Played in two grand finals. Grand finals, yeah. Grand finals, <laughs> Do you, remember, do you remember your first ever try? Because I know you're a man that likes to try. We've mentioned plenty of tries so far. Do you remember your first try in first grade? Who your opponents were? No. Who was it? It was round three against the Sydney Roosters at the SFS in 95. Right. I would have no idea. I, I was on an edge then. So it probably would have been, you know, a long shift. And I would have been a decent try. I've, I've got it on big league video. Uh, oh, yeah. 95 season on big league video. And, and there's, there's footage of that try. It's a good try, mate. Yeah. I'll have to send it through to me, mate. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll get yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I definitely it. cannot remember that. And I should do. I only scored 30. That's what surprises <laughs> me. We, we get, we get guys on like yourself and, and say, um, uh, Campo and that who, who aren't prolific try scorers and you and Michael Luck and you would think that they'd remember their first tries and they never do but then you talk to a guy like Clinton Torpy and he can rattle off every try he ever scored yeah. you know it's, yeah yeah <laughs> oh well centers aren't that busy mate so they haven't yeah. much to do. <laughs> no, that's all they're there for is scoring tries good point <laughs> yeah. um you were talking about the the 95 grand final before um 94 you guys obviously lost 95 you win what was the, the key to the turnaround of form and, and, the, and the, if for that memorable run to the grand final that year? Yeah, I remember we um, I was on the bench and we got beaten by Parramatta, who we should have beaten earlier, uh, you know, probably halfway through the season. Um, and I think I, I'm, I, I think I had my first start in 95. Yep. And um, it was round, against Newcastle. Round 13, yeah. And um, Jason Smith played for Australia, say, on the Friday night, and he didn't back up. We played the Knights on a Saturday, and we got beaten, I think, 42-0. Yes. Yeah. Like, we got absolutely – all we were doing was kicking off. John's masterclass. I can't remember. You could, yeah. you could remember that was your first game you played. You can remember the score, but you couldn't remember when you first scored your first First time I started. First time I started. Yeah, first run on, yeah. yeah you, don't forget, you don't forget flogged, getting flogged 42 No, you don't. Yeah, no. No, so um, that was pretty significant. 
And then, you know, obviously the Super League stuff was going on. Yep. Um, April 1st, April Fool's Day started. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had, obviously, Dino, <clears throat> Dino, Jimmy, Jay Smith and Jared sort of jump back to the ARL. Yep. Um, so publicly that was a big thing. But Chris uh, was a bit old school, you know, in those days. And when we weren't playing well, we'd just go to the pub and the boys would have a few beers and sort out what we had, whatever we had to sort out. And then we'd be able to, we'd be right. Um, I didn't drink, Has didn't drink, and Matty Ryan didn't drink. So we'd be just sitting in the corner of the pub watching the boys get off whatever they had to get off their chest. Um, and it always worked for some reason, it'd work. And so we had a couple of those opportunities and then we went on a bit of a run and yeah. um, the sort of final series, I suppose, was quite amazing. Um, you know, against St. George, Dino, um, what he did to Glenn Lazarus when we played Brisbane. Yeah, bashed and, um, bashed Glenn Lazarus, eh? Yeah. Uh, broke his rib. And then obviously the Raiders, who were an unbelievable team, you know, did a big job on us the year before and, and were able to sort of um, do what we did in the grand final uh, qualifier. So, yeah, huge sort of games. And then to come up against a team like Manly, who had lost two games all year. Yeah. And, like, we were just turning up to be beaten from, if you listen to the media. Um, Bar got sent off for 10 minutes. And, yeah, I don't know. It just, everything sort of went our way, I suppose, and everything didn't go Mealy's way for once. Yeah. Um, it was it was incredible, mate. The, the scenes of the Leagues Club when we arrived to catch the bus into the ground, it had been the same in every semi-final leading up to it, but the grand final was... It was atomic, like, it was unbelievable. Um, we had pretty much an entourage taking us into the ground of, and these days it would be absolutely illegal. There's guys all over trucks, yeah, you know, yeah. on the back of tray trucks in blue and white, all blue and white all over the trucks. And they're doing 80, you know, leading the bus, <laughs> crazy stuff. But, yeah, it was truly incredible and, Back in the old Sydney football stadium days where it was afternoon grand finals. Yep. Um, I, I always loved those semi-finals and grand finals because whenever you played at the Sydney footy stadium on a Sunday Arvo, you knew that was big time, you know. Okay. Uh, Ray Warren commentator, you knew yep. it was a big dance um, and that was what you wanted to play in. So uh, it, was, it was a privilege to be a part of that, those, those teams. We had some outstanding players, um, truly blessed to have played with Terry Lamb and, you know, Dean Pays and Darren Britts and, you know, Hetherington's Halligans, you know, all of these guys, Matty Ryans, Rod Silvers, they were super talented players and were really, really good guys and we all got on really well. And Chris was very good at creating a good environment. How did the previous year's experience in the losing grand final help you the, the following year? against like the manly. Yeah, you know, they always say that you gotta lose one to win one, but I was still trying to make my find my way. Um, I really got into the team because Robert Ralph broke his um, eye socket. And uh, Jason Smith had been injured and was coming back from injury and Chris didn't want to start with Jace. So it was it was a big surprise for me to actually start against Canberra. Um, I was even surprised when Chris came to me and said, I'm going to start with you. And I, I couldn't believe it, but I was, you know, very excited. And, um, yeah, it seemed to work. So then he went with the same for the grand final. And Jace come on and did a tremendous – he did a great job off the bench. Uh, he went on the tour at the end of that year. So, you know, he was an outstanding player, Jay Smith. Um, but he was on the bench for us, so – um, yeah, Chris obviously had an idea at the time and seemed to have worked. But, yeah, I think in the warm-up, Mark Carroll had a head collision with someone and split himself. And I think, you know, that's probably when it sort of started to go bad for Manly, <laughs> um, you know, on their dream day, I suppose. It, it was crazy when you look back at it. They were, they were like winks, you know, on that day. They, there was nothing that was going to beat them on that day, but... We were able to. 
Yeah, don't sell yourself short, mate. You played your role in that grand final. You um, first scorer in the grand final off a dubious uh, Jimmy Dimmick pass. Uh, uh, no, Jimmy's, Jimmy's I, I got it from Simon. That's right. So Jimmy, Jimmy offloaded it to Simon. So my oh, pass, oh, that's right. my yeah. pass from Simon was sweet as. That yeah. was, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a good pass. Yeah. No, but um, yeah, mate, you see how young I was. Well, I was 21 years old. So it and was wearing headgear. You're wearing headgear, headgear. Yeah. Yeah. and torpedoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and torpedoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you? Ninety five um, is also remembered for the Super League war, as you as you touched on before. Yeah. Um, so obviously the Bulldogs were minus those key players you mentioned: uh, Dimmick Smith, McCracken, Pay, Brett Dallas as well. Um, how do you how do you remember how that all went down at that at that point in time in '95 or April one as you as you said? Yeah, so all those boys played. Um, the only one who didn't play in the grand final was um, was Jared. So mm-hmm. he'd sort of had a falling out with Chris um, over all that. But the other guys, Jimmy and and Dino and Jace, they were all good. Um, Bretto, he obviously was signed with the ARL, so he um, he left uh, at the end of that. And Terry was going to retire. He obviously announced his retirement. Um, then he came back because we lost, I think, 11 internationals um, at the end of that season. Jace Williams went to Penrith. Uh, we, had, we lost the whole heap. And so Bar come back and we didn't make the semis at 96. We're a really young team, but by Bar coming back, it was selfless. And it really helped us as a young group. Um, and then 97 was when Super League actually started when the two comps did separate. Um, but 96, we sort of went full time. Uh, that was the whole idea of Super League. So I was working at Westpac Bank as a, as a bank Johnny. And uh, I had to give that job up. And we we're full time. So we we're at the club pretty much from seven till five every day. Um, you know, Monday to Friday, and then obviously play on Saturday or Sunday or Friday night. So and that happened in 96, uh, 97 Super League actually started. We um, we made the semis, but um, got knocked out by Penrith. And then 98 was when um, well, Chris went to Melbourne and folks who took over as head coach and we made the grand final. Like, unbelievably, we we had to beat Melbourne um, at, at Belmore and um, it was the wettest, one of the wettest games I've ever played in. Belmore had just been re, refurbished in the way of the surface. So the surface took the water away as quick as it could, but I think Craig Polamalu nearly drowned when he scored him. The other try that was scored that night. <laughs> it was that wet. But um, yeah, I, all I remember was we won that game like 8 6 or 8 4 or something. And we went on a run then. I think we won 10 out of the last 12. Um, we had to beat uh, the Steelers at Illawarra in the last game. Craig Polamana kicked a field goal in the last minute. You won by one, didn't you? You just the the game. remember that. Yeah. And then we beat St. George in the first week of the semi. We were down 12 nil after. 10 minutes, played at Cogger, and we come back and beat them. And I think we had to play North Sydney at, at North Sydney. Go the Bears. Our red hot team. So, sorry, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Go the Bears. <laughs> but, yeah, 23 2 or something. Yeah, and yeah. Um, <laughs> folks, he said, if someone doesn't um, like put Jason Taylor on his ass when he kicks it, then you won't have to worry about playing the next week because I'll drop you. Well, Barry Ward, I, he stepped me and Barry Ward was flying through and he actually hit him high and poor old Wardy got suspended for the rest of the year. So he missed out on the grand final. <laughs> so that's unfortunate for Wardy, but um, he listened to the coach, obviously. And then obviously we had the, the Parramatta game and the Newcastle game where we were down 18-2 in one game, 18-6 in the other game with 10 minutes a game, come back and won in overtime, and then played Brisbane. We were leading at halftime, which we hadn't led at halftime at all, and then they ran over the top of us. But that was 
that was a crazy run. Joe and I were going to go to Phuket at the end of that year. And um, we thought, obviously, we weren't going to make the finals. So we decided not to book it until we worked out when we could actually go. And we didn't end up going. Yeah. <laughs> that, that Parramatta game, that semi-final against Parramatta, that's one of the greatest games of all time. Um, the the Daryl Halligan pressure sideline conversion and the the Paul Carriage brain explosions and everything. I'll, I'll never forget that game. That was, that was yeah, crazy. it was, mate. It's oh, I really feel sorry for Paul. Yeah, um, he's, he's no, he's brought up a bit, doesn't he? He had such a good season, and and he's sort of always brought up about. That it was only probably a ten minute period. You know, it was probably the overtime period or just leading into it. Um, I, you know, even though that field guard. Showed it didn't go over. I still believe it went over. Yeah, it I couldn't close. believe it went that close. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, truly amazing year. And our reserve grade um, went through to the grand final that day as well. So it was a big day for the Bulldogs. You came up against the red hot Brisbane side though in that grand final. I mean, seriously, that was one of the most stacked teams of probably the, the NRL era featuring our last week's guest, um, Kevin Campion. Um, yeah, it was. I I, um, I made my test debut after that grand final, and there was nine Broncos in that in the test team. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how the maths worked on the salary cap, but yeah, <laughs> they were just lucky, I suppose, to get nine players picked. Um, <laughs> yeah, good season from you. So you selected for the Kangaroos at the end of the '98 season. Um, you make your debut in a 30 to 12 victory over the Kiwis at Lang Park. Mate, tell us what it was like to get that call up and the emotions around representing your country for the first time. Yeah, it was it was at Suncorp um, or Lane Park. So I was, Park, yeah. yeah, I was really, I'll tell you, when I actually ran out in the green and gold, you know, uh, mum and the family were there, you know, Joe. Um, I, I actually was crying during the National Anthem. It was something I dreamt of. And I'm a really visual person. So when I want to achieve something, I do dream about it that much that, you know, if I actually get to do it, it feels like I've already been there. And I'd actually been in that moment so many times prior to that. Felt as though that, you know, I'm just having another dream. Um, but it was real. And I came off the bench and I got on, I think I was on five minutes and Joe Wagner got me with one of his big um, rabbit killers and knocked me out. Uh, I ended up going back on, but he got me good, and uh, yeah, I don't remember much of that game, but all I know is we lost the Anzac test at the start of the year. Mm. Bob Fulton was the coach. Yep. It was a manly dominated team. Um, I think Lockie made his debut, and the Kiwis beat us. Mm. And then game uh, at Lane Park, we won, and then we had to go to Auckland, play at North Harbour um, the, a week later to um, to play the Kiwis again, which all I remember that that game was the build-up to the game with all those Broncos guys in it. We stayed at um, the Novotel in Auckland. And um, all I remember is trying to get to my room, having to go through Webke, Thorne, Talis, um, Sailor. It was a gauntlet just to try and get to the room. Like every time you go, they were like Raptors, they jump out of their room and wrestle you into their room and pretty much bash you and then they'd get sick of that and then you get to the next room and it, it just kept on going all the way down the hallway. Wayne just killed to himself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what an experience. What an initiation. <laughs> um, prior, prior to the 99 season, um, the Bulldogs signed two of the biggest names in rugby league, Ricky Stewart and Bradley Clyde. Um, we've all seen Ricky as a coach over the years. W was he that angry as a player? Yeah, he was, mate. He's a, he's a massive competitor, um, huge competitor. And, right, being able to, like, I played against him and in those unbelievable um, camera sides. And even even Clyde, like, I was in awe of Clyde as an opponent and as a kid growing up, you know, watched him play. Uh, he, he didn't outsee Bobby. But he was a tremendous player. And then to actually see how meticulous he was firsthand. Um, and the same with Ricky. 
his passing and his kicking was phenomenal. Um, he put bombs up and I'd be just looking at him going, you poor bugger, whoever the fullback was. Yeah. Um, and just so smart, you know, like he'd tell you where to be. Be like Joey Johns. Um, Joey's the best player I've played against and with um, in my time. He could kick off either feet. He could um, pass off either side and hit his target. He could tackle and he could step, run, do the whole lot. So, um, but Ricky, unfortunately, I think it might have been against the Warriors, break his leg and that yeah, sort of ended his thousands. career, yeah. which sort of ruined our season uh, that year that that we were going pretty good and um, broke his leg. So, but it was really, really good to play with Rick and Clyde. I uh, learned a lot off both of them, um, just in their preparation and, and just in games, just being able to reset if things aren't going right. Um, and then when they are, being able to really put the foot on the throat. Mate, 99 um, was probably your best year for try scoring. You, you went on a bit of a purple patch. You scored five tries in seven games. As a front rower, is it always a good feeling when you get that first try of the season, you're off the nudie run? <laughs> hey, being in the front row, scoring a try is always good. Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I used to get so excited. I, I never had a try celebration. I'd just throw the ball up. Throw the ball up in the air. Yeah, and that's yeah. right. That's it. That was, I was just so excited. I'd just do that and then go, who's close? I'm going to hug you. <laughs> Uh, and that never changed. I don't know why, but they never changed. Uh, probably because it didn't get to sort of do it too often. But um, yeah, always, always really good. And I suppose um, one of the really good things when I went to the Warriors, and I know we're going to get to the Warriors, but mm. we, we actually became a real threat. Rubes, um, myself, Rubes, Eva, Tumabavi, um, you know, Benny Madalino, yep. um, yeah. Sonny mm. Fye. Um, Nathan Fain, Georgie Gaddis in that middle area, in the middle yeah. sort of part of the field. Um, we'd, we'd have a whole heap of plays where a real threat in the middle. So then that made it really easy for your Simon Mannerings and your Money Vardavis on the edge because we were a threat in the middle. Yep. They had to worry about us. So that made it really easy for our edge. Um, I think one year our middles scored something like 15 or 20 tries between us which is unheard of. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Manu was scoring 20-something tries. And, it was a game, yeah. And, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so um, what, I, what I did learn was pretty early on when I went from the edge into the middle, folksy put me there because we didn't have any front rowers as well as I wasn't playing that good sort of on the edge. I was sort of there, but if the ball didn't come to me, I wouldn't get involved. So he wanted to get me more involved. So he threw me in the middle and made it really, really simple for me. That helped my game. And I think they've done that with Cohen Hess. You know, I think his game's improved since he's gone in the middle. Yeah. Um, but I worked out pretty quick that you can't just run straight and hard every run because you're just going to get absolutely crippled. Um, so you had to be a little bit creative. And I wasn't one of the biggest front rowers. So I had to come use probably my agility and, I didn't have speed, but um, I know what you call, say, smarts. Footy brain. Yeah, and I played with Darren Britt, who was one of the smartest front rowers I've ever played with. Very skillful, and I watched him a lot. And I also watched Glenn Lazarus a lot, who was very big. He was a big man. So I sort of tried to come up with a, you know, a combination or a hybrid of both, as well as what my strengths and weaknesses were. Um and come up with my game, I suppose. And unfortunately, we went through that period of Super League where there was unlimited interchange. So my strength was being able to play long minutes. And then when Super League come along, it's sort of the powerful athletes, big, just get them out there, get them off, get them out there, get them off. Yep. Um, and I sort of battled along there for a while, trying to survive in that. And then when it went back to limited in a change again, um, I was able to start to make a bit of a bit of a way. Um, people always sort of had this perception that I was always concerned about stats, but the stats for me, all they did was measure my involvement in the game. Mm -hmm. And I knew the more I was involved in the game, the better I played. 
Um, particularly Origin, if Jonathan Thurston or Greg Inglis or Darren Lockyer or Billy Slater or Carl Michael Hunt were getting man of the match, then we knew we'd done our job. And, um, you know, you go club land, if Stacey or Manu or, you go Bulldogs has them or whoever were getting man of the match, Jono, you know, those guys were getting man of the match. That meant the middle were doing their job. Yep. And I always felt that that was a real pat on the back for the for the middle guys because you don't get a lot of accolades in the middle. But that's how I sort of looked at it um, in a way that, you know, if we don't do our job, those guys can't be getting those sort of rewards. So um, I started to try and be um, a lot more dynamic in regards to pre-line, post-line and having footwork so that you're a bit of a threat um, dynamically rather than just being one-dimensional. Yep. And pretty sort of taught me that. Um, and I just, every year I sort of worked on it. Um, and the older I got, the slower I got, but the smarter you got. So it's sort of a funny one and really enjoyed my footy. You know, at the Bulldogs, learning all that stuff and then at the Warriors, um, being able to utilise all the things that I learned. But then with so many young guys, I got such a boost of enthusiasm from the young guys and a freshness of a new country, learning a lot of stuff outside of footy. Um, and lifestyle was a little bit different. Yep. Uh, and Bulldogs, been there 12 years, um, doing the same thing at the same place with the same people. Uh, the change was sort of good in a way. Um, unexpected. I thought I'd be at the Bulldogs my whole life, but um, yeah, it's the way it went. And um, yeah, I, I, I was very emotional when time came to leave the Bulldogs, but uh, very proud of what I'd achieved at the Bulldogs and very proud of how I left the Bulldogs. You know, um, being able to leave with a premiership also didn't get to play in the game um, was quite incredible and to have been able to captain the club was something I always sort of strive to do and one of the things Bullfrog um, mentioned when I signed with the club because I was always a captain when I was a kid so um, it was a bit one of those things that the Bulldogs is a bit, of, a bit like the Royal Family you sort of got to wait for the current captain to go and then you got to be sort of around about the right place to be able to get that opportunity. So when my opportunity came up, Britty decided to go to England. Um, it was between me, Darren Smith and Braith and Astor. So I was in the middle of the other two. Braith was really young and Smithy was a bit more experienced and folks who chose me. So um, it was, yeah, really cool. Yeah, it was. That was that 2002 season and, it looks to be the season where it all came together for the dogs. As you, you said, we spoke about it earlier. Um, you go on that streak where you win 17 straight games um, before ironically being beaten by the Warriors. Warriors and then yeah. a week later, <laughs> and then a week, a week later, the team is, is stripped of all competition points, um, effectively consigning the team to the wooden spoon. Yeah. As fans, yeah. we only see what, what the media portrays to us, but as, as the captain, how did you, manage that scenario with a team full of so many young players? Yeah, it was pretty smart management from the start. We decided it was only going to be myself and folks here that were going to talk uh, yep. publicly. Um, we had some guys, you know, very different personalities. So that would send a whole lot of different messages. So, which made it a little bit hard for me being the captain in my first year that I had to be quite measured on what I said how I said it and what I said, uh, the way I said it. Um, yeah. It didn't change what I said. I always was very honest and open. But, um, you know, I think what it taught me was to be very honest and also be very approachable because trying to avoid it doesn't help. No, it, only, it only helps people throw more grenades. Whereas if you front up, it's very hard to bag someone when they're standing face to face. Yeah, I learned that really quick. Um, we played, we played um, a Friday night game. I think, I think it might have been Parramatta, 
and then it on was the Saturday, the game after the Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, and then on the Saturday was when we'd heard late Friday that the, the story was going to break Saturday morning, which we knew nothing about. And um, I was supposed to go on uh, Channel 7 Sport on the Sunday. And um, our media officer said, oh, I can cancel if you want. And I said, no, nah, I committed to it three weeks ago and we're still going to go on it. Bruce McIlvaney was the host. And when I turned up, he goes, mate, you've got some brass monkeys turned up here. And um, I've gone, oh, shit, you know, it's not be good. <laughs> but they actually were, they were actually very, very timid. Um, and he said, when, I, when we went off air at the end of it, he goes, I've got I to give it to you. We didn't think you'd turn up and we were absolutely going to launch on you guys. And he said, because you turned up, you know, we couldn't launch on you because you fronted up. And it was such a great lesson to learn. And everything from then on, whatever I got asked to do, I'd do. Um, if I got asked a question, I'd answer it as honestly as I could. If I couldn't answer yep. it, I'd say that I couldn't answer it. Um, and I think the club became closer with the fans during the Super League period. Sort of the fans, you know, became a little bit distant from the players. And um, during that period, we come really close with our fans. And uh, I think that game against Brisbane, like we played Canberra the weekend that we found out what the punishment was. And we were down, I think, 20-0 after 20 minutes, and we come back and got beaten 32-30, I think. Yeah. And then the next week we played the Storm and we did a job on the Storm. And then um, and then we played Brisbane last game at uh, the showgrounds. And I saw Wayne before the game and he goes, mate, you're not going to win today. And I go, like, we are. Brisbane were playing for the opportunity to finish minor premiers. Yeah. And um, the only way the Warriors would finish minor premiers is if we beat Brisbane. Yeah. May it was packed out. There was more Bulldogs fans there than I think were recorded. And um, after the game, it was pandemonium. Like the fans raced onto the field. Um, oh, it was, it was, it was truly emotional. It was, it was, it was really, really cool. If, you know, it, was, it wasn't better than winning the comp, but it was the next best thing. Yeah, um, yeah. The craziest thing during that sort of week was folks who was driving home after we got the points handed down, we we're going to lose 37 competition points. Yep. Yeah. And he's driving home and he's going to go on the M5 and he went through a red light. And um, the copper saw him and pulled him over. And uh, you're going, oh, yeah, this is typical, like just finishing off my day. And then the copper says something like, oh, you know, have you got any reasoning why you went through the red light? And he goes, no, I haven't. But he said, I don't think I'm going to lose more than 37 points today, am I? <laughs> <laughs> and he obviously worked out that Bulldogs had just been stripped 37 points. So the <laughs> folks actually lost 39 points that day. Going <laughs> 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 through the red light. Oh. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a, a huge night, mate. We did a job on the Bronx. We had everything to play for, and we had nothing to play for. Um, but the thing I was most proud of with that group is that we didn't drop our bundle. Um, you know, we could have quite easily thrown the toys out of the cot and so we don't want to play, or we're just going to roll over. Um, I think we won twenty games that year. I think we lost three and drew one, something like that, which at the time was the most winningest sort of season. And yeah, yeah. like no one could take that away from us. Whilst we had an asterisk beside our name, it would still show how many wins we had, how many losses we had. And we lost the first game of the year against the West Tigers. Yeah. We drew against the Broncos the second game. And then we lost to the Warriors and lost to the Raiders after the yeah. recap. So... Yeah, it was, it was a phenomenal year and um, I was really, really proud of that group. Um, we lost a few like Nigel and Trevor Norton and the end of the year, but um, we're still really tight, that group. 
uh, we've got our own WhatsApp group and um, <laughs> and we're always commenting on how the Bulldogs are going currently and how the game's going and it's really cool. So I think that helped us continue on 2002. 2001, we made the finals, sort of got bundled out after two weeks. Yep. 2002, you know, we were sort of favourites to win it. 2003, we ended up playing the Roosters in the grand final qualifier. Warriors, War- you know. Francis Melly scored five tries on you, remember? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which which changed our course. Yeah. Warriors did its job on us at home at... at, um, at uh, the show yeah. yeah. Franny scoring five, uh, unbelievable that night. Um, and then we went obviously on the other side of the draw, which put us to have to play the Roosters to get to the grand final. And we bashed each other, um, which that's not the reason why Penrith beat the Roosters. But um, yeah, I know that we we're, were really hurting. So if we had made the grand final, we wouldn't have been too good that week. Um, and then, you know, obviously 04, we were able to actually play the yeah, grand final. Yeah. Everyone had hoped to have happened two years earlier and even one year earlier. Yeah. Um, which played every game that year, both origin, test footy, and club footy. And the only one I didn't play in was the grand final. And um, sort of went through the, the whole process of, Decided to go to the Warriors during Origin. Um, my wife had to fly over to New Zealand. And I, I felt it was important for her to be comfortable with the move. So she did a little undercover trip and flew over and had a look around and said, yeah, I've got absolutely no problems to live over in New Zealand and in Auckland. And so then I uh, made the call, which not too many people were expecting um, to move. And um, the good thing for that was it was very emotional. I was bawling my eyes out when I told the players, but that was good because I was able to release that, um, you know, emotion. And then publicly, I was able to just um, be really, the decisions made now, I've got another eight or 10 weeks with the Bulldogs and I want it to be the best eight weeks of my time here, you know. And it was, except for uh, the first two minutes of the Penrith game, which yeah. did my medium. Um, but again, taught me a lot out of that. Um, that grand final week, uh, we sort of made it all about me to yep. take pressure off Jono and, and Bobcat because Andrew was going to be the captain for the first time and uh, Jono was going to be playing, which no one expected. Um, Jonathan Thurston and so it was all about me trying to get on the field and and then um, that helped me in a way because I was sort of focused on you know processing and saying publicly that I'm going to be able to play and hyperbaric chamber and all this sort of stuff which I knew I wasn't going to be able to play but I was almost convinced so there, was, there was never a chance that you were going to play that game? No chance no. I went to the surgeon on the Monday and um, he got he had the scan, and I said, "Is there any pot? Can you do any surgery that can put a rubber band in there or anything?" And he said, "No, I wish I could, but I can't." Um, so we knew early on that I wasn't going to play. I knew when I did it because I'd done a medial before, so I knew what I'd done. Um, but I got to say that whole experience really taught me a lot about what it takes to win a comp. And I felt like a Harry, Harry hang on on grand final day. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, you're there and everyone's trying to make you feel a part of it, but you actually don't because you're not actually on the field. And folks who did such an amazing job and the players to make me feel so, such an integral part of it. And with what John O did after the game and all of that. But when we did the speech after the game, you realise how many people play a part in getting that result yep. who aren't wearing a jersey on that day. No, there was another seven guys who didn't play that day who were just as, you know, Google, yeah. 100%. They don't yep. play those yep. games that they played. We don't get to where we got to. Yep. Um, yep. And I really understood 
about what it takes to win a comp. Um, when you're that guy sitting on the bench who was a part of the team but isn't a part because of injury. Um, and it was my last game at the club. And, you know, with what John A did, I think that's just a true testament to the person we all saw him become as a player. Yep. He's so, you know, his humility and what, what his ethics are about. Like, he thought it was more important for me to get it than him. And that was his first grand final. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no guarantee he was gonna he was gonna make another or win one at least, yeah. you know. Like he was yeah. going to the Cowboys who, Cowboys who had never won a comp, you know. Yep. So yeah, crazy, crazy, but yeah, really, really cool way to finish at the club. Um that I turned up as a boy and left as a married man with three kids, yep. you know, father with three kids. So yeah, huge, huge. And then really looked forward to my new new journey. Um, uh, went over uh, sort of to start training and uh, look for a. So, oh, sorry, we had a week off after the grand final, and then we flew over for four days in, into Auckland and had a look around at where we were going to live. And the club really helped us out in that area, and pretty much. I'm a bit of a basketball fan and sort of knew someone at the breakers. So they organised for some tickets. So we were going to the game and I saw this house um, that was for sale and I rang up the real estate agent and said, can we have a look? We're going to the basketball. Can we have a look on the way? And they said, yeah, yep, no worries. I'm not too far away. I'll drop in. Like it's not an open, the open house is earlier, but drop in and we really liked it. So we put in an offer and, didn't realise that by putting in an offer then meant it's almost like a blind auction that it was going to auction. So as soon as someone puts an offer in, then the other interested parties get to make an offer as well. And it's the one the actual seller gets to choose who they want. So anyway, we got it. So that was good to know that we were going to have a house. Yeah. Um, came back, I had my knee injury. My first training session, it was raining, it was freezing cold. I'm like a schoolboy, you know, first day at school in my new gear. And there's a couple of Maldi boys on the hill going, Steve Price. Oh, hey, boys. <laughs> You're a Bulldogs captain, eh? And I go, yeah, yeah, Bulldogs captain. Oh, you just won the comp, eh? And I said, yeah, yeah, won the comp. Oh, you just play with that Sonny Bill Williams, eh? I said, yeah, yeah, play with Sonny Bill. He's an amazing player. Oh, you signed with the Warriors? And I said, yeah, yeah, signed with the Warriors. That's sort of why I'm here in a Warriors shirt. <laughs> oh, man, I wish they had a sign Sonny Bill Williams instead of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so oh, welcome. Oh, man. <laughs> I was packing stuff up back in, in Sydney. And I go, oh, don't worry about it, doll. I hate me. <laughs> You're not in Belmore uh, anymore. <laughs> club had... Uh, my Suzu big truck. Oh, yeah. Was a car I had straight from Japan. Um, so it was, you can only go up, I think, Channel 95 on uh, yeah. FM. So there was only one station I could listen to. <laughs> and not many, if any, was a song by Scribe oh, yeah. at the time. And that song was played, I think, every three songs. <laughs> and so I'm driving back from training. It's raining, like freezing cold. I'm crying. These little Maori kids have just made me feel this big. <laughs> <laughs> that the club I've just signed for for three years. I've just gone. Oh, oh. Go, go, going back to that decision to go to the Warriors. So um, you said earlier in the discussion that one of the reasons that you went there was because Folksy didn't want you to play rep footy going forward and the Warriors were quite happy for you to continue your rep footy career. Yeah. Was there any other clubs interested or, or courting you at that time? And if so, what what was it about the Warriors that made you decide? Because that's a massive move mm. going from, you know, a, a Sydney-based club over to a club based in a different country. Yeah, so what, what happened, the short version is, uh, during the salary cap, so just before we had the salary cap issue, I'd agreed to a new deal. So I'd agreed to it on principle, sign a document, just hadn't signed the actual contract. Then the salary cap stuff come out and then Steve Morton was the CEO and he wanted to sign me because I was the captain. 
And I said, well, we've already signed a contract because he come in for the, um, you know, for um, Bobby Hagan, I think. Yep. Um, anyway, so Turvey says, I want to sign you. And we said, well, we've already signed, like, agreed. And so we sent him that contract, like, that letter. And he goes, oh, mate, we're not going to be able to do that. And so I go, right, so what can you do? So we all took a 20% pay cut. Yep. And I pretty much was on the same money that I was already on. Yep. which wasn't sort of the money I should have been. But anyway, that's what happened. So he said, all right, what we'll do is he goes, within the next two years, he goes, we'll be able to sort it out. So he said, sign a four-year deal and two years is um, your favour. And then obviously two years will be the club's favour. Okay, right, no worries. So that two years had sort of passed, 2004, um, one of the guys, staff member at the at the Warriors, brother-in-law used to work at the Bulldogs. Okay. So he knew my contract. No one else did. And he knew it. And so one of the guys of the Warriors rung me just out of the blue and said, you know, would you be interested in talking to the Warriors? Not coming to the Warriors, talking to the Warriors. And I sort of thought, you know what? It's not going to hurt just having a chat. But I'd never, ever had that discussion. But the club had just re-signed Mark O'Mealy, I think Willie Mason, Brayton Astor, you know, Sonny Bill. So those guys had just been re-signed. And I thought, oh, that's a bit strange when Turvey said, we're going to work it out in the next two years. I thought I would have been one of the sort of first ones to get sorted from what yep, I'd agreed yeah. to. And so I thought, oh, I'll just leave it. You know, yep, sure, we'll have a chat. So I met at the Novotel at... Sydney Olympic Park with um, one of the Warriors guys and uh, just had a really good chat. He just said, um, you know, what they were thinking and there was no figures spoken, but how much the club would like to have me there and understand the pressures the Bulldogs are faced with and blah, blah, blah. And so then uh, my manager was George Mimas. Yep. So I had a chat with George about it. And then he then took up the discussions to continue. And he was also chatting with the Bulldogs and nothing was changing in the Bulldogs. Um, and we eventually got to a stage where basically they couldn't give me any more money um, than what I was on, which I'd already taken a pretty big pay cut. And it was going to be really difficult to keep me, Haz and Jono. So that's sort of where the club had got to. Um, the club also sacked Gary Hughes, who I had so much respect for and was the glue at the club. Uh, he was our football manager. Yep. And he got the sack over the sex sort of um, accusation. Um, yep. we, we had to go and see lawyers. And just one day at training, Gaz picked four guys, uh, six guys to go into the lawyers to see them and they had to go to the police to give their statement. And we're doing it in lots, but that was the first time that we'd done it. And there's not too many guys that wear three-piece suit to training. Yeah. So the boys that went, Sonny Bill was one, Mace was another one. Sonny Bill, we were sponsored by Nike and yep. Sonny had a Nike shirt on, which was Texas Longhorns. And their motto was, we play dirty. So... The media took a photo of that and blew it up and that was the front page of the paper. And this is like how disrespectful the Bulldogs players are. This is a very big accusation, blah, blah, blah. And Mace was wearing thongs and board shorts and like yep. look at what they're wearing. And so Gary Hughes got sacked over that, which that wasn't the Bulldogs way. And Gaz was born and bred Canterbury. Yes. Uh, yes. Played for the club a whole lot. And I thought, you know what? If that's what can happen to a guy that is born and bred, like I want to be here forever, but if that can happen to him, I've got to think about the most important team I, I have, which is the one I come home to every night. Yep. And so that's the only thing that changed in my head was that. And that's what made the Warriors scenario a bit more uh, viable. And yeah, there was just a few other things that, had sort of happened that sort of got me thinking a little bit differently. And then the Warriors just got keener and keener and keener. And um, George didn't want me to go. He didn't have a player at, at, at the Warriors. Uh, Jim Bennigan had most of the players at the Warriors. 
Yep. Um, so that was going to be new territory for George. But um, when I made the decision, eventually made the decision, and I spoke to Wayne Bennett, was one of the guys yep. I spoke yep. to. Um, yeah, I decided to go, and that was a really, really hard decision, but I decided to make the decision to go, and um, it was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It was awesome uh, for us as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Fan. yeah, it was a it was a I can remember when the news broke, it was a massive uh news for, for the Warriors fans and supporters. It was yeah, absolutely huge. Because I, I think, think the one big... of those signings you didn't think because I think we'd already signed Ruben or we're in talks with Ruben at the same time. Yeah, you were. So I don't I think the club was hopeful of getting one of us. Yeah. <laughs> then got both right. of us. Yeah. And that sort of <laughs> stuffed things up a little bit. But um yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was really excited to hear that Rubes was looking to go. Yep. Because I got I had so much respect for him and I knew how much the young Kiwi boys, how much mana they had yep. for Rubes. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be so cool. Playing with a guy who's got so much respect of all of his, you know, and at the Bulldogs, every time we played in Auckland, like there was always a sellout. Like I think the Bulldogs were one of the favourites, the Kiwis and obviously the Warriors, so it was always a big crowd and I thought this would be so cool to play as the home team one day because yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Auntie was giving it to me every time I played with the Bulldogs. You know, <laughs> some of the things I was caught over there, I was just going, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, it was so intimidating and they had such a, an amazing team, you know, Ali and, you know, all those guys, Stacey, and uh, they were just so hard to stop and I thought, It'd be pretty cool. And the other thing that was really big for me was I walked into the Bulldogs and the culture and the history was already there of expectation. And Ruben was yeah. the same at Canberra. You know, if you didn't reach that expectation or that standard, you didn't survive. And I sort of felt like the Warriors had had a lot of success, but then they sort of also the next minute had sort of no, you know, um, failure. Yeah. That was exactly there was no consistency there, and I thought it'd be really cool to be a part of trying to create some sort of consistency and a real culture of what I walked into at the Bulldogs as well as Rubes walked into at the Raiders. Yeah, uh, and that was a really cool part because we had a lot of young kids like Manu and Sonny, and mm -hmm. you know, Rusty Packer, um, Benny Madalino, you know, the names go on of all the young boys. There was, you know, Jerome Rapati, um, all these young kids that were coming through, yep. Simon Mannering, um, that for once the Warriors were getting the top of the crop yep. rather than yep. the Sydney Cubs. And that's what we had to change as well. Like all the Kiwi kids would look at going to Australia first and then the Warriors was the last resort. Yep. We would have changed that over that period of the Warriors became the most attractive and then if we didn't get picked up by the Warriors, then we'd go to a Sydney club, which yeah. was amazing. Um, and my biggest fear was, I suppose, how the wife and the kids would find living in New Zealand and whether they were ex um, accepted. And that was the greatest part, mate. If I've got to say our greatest experience, um, the football was amazing from a rugby league player's perspective, but the actual life experience far outweighed anything that I experienced from the football side, which was amazing. Like the semi-final we played in 08 against the Roosters at home semi-final was unforgettable. I'll never forget that. It was up there with origin in regards to atmosphere and yeah. credit. It was incredible. I was crying when I'm walking around. I was that emotional walking around to do the toss because we were on the other side of the field. I had to walk around and all the fans got there early on the end because they were the cheaper seats. Yeah. They were there for the earlier games and they were going nuts when I walked around and I'm like bawling. And I'm sure they're thinking, oh my God, he's crying. Is he going to be all right to play this today? <laughs> I got around and Freddie's the captain of the Roosters and he's going, are you all right, bro? And I go, yeah, man, this is awesome. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and just, uh, the experience the kids got, like like Riley, my son, he was three when we moved over there. Yep. 
Lacey, my second daughter, she was six, and Jamie, my eldest, she was eight. So the majority of their schooling in New Zealand, um, they pretty much grew up, you know, and became young adults in New Zealand. And yep. um, it, was a, it was a perfect place for them to grow up and become young, young adults. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons why we went there too. We were looking at going to England, but I sort of felt it was during sort of terrorism time and I thought if something happened, we're still close enough to get home. Home, yeah. If we had to or if something happened at home, we could still come home. But if we're in England, that, that makes it a bit harder. And New Zealand's a little bit different but not too different. So that was going to be a really cool experience for the kids. But it won't be a big change. You know, it'll be a cool sort of just a little twist on it, you know. And that absolutely was. Um, you know, I signed a three-year deal and we just said, let's just see how it goes. And we stayed there 13 years. Yeah. And, yeah. and the biggest lesson that I learned in New Zealand is about family. Because yep. that is yeah. the most important thing in your whole life. And yep. I thought that family was important to me as a young kid in Australia. But the New Zealand has taught me what family actually is yeah. and how important it is. And that's the only reason why we moved back from New Zealand. Otherwise, we'd still be there. Yeah. Because we wanted to be closer to our family. Yep. Um, otherwise, mate, we'd still be there. And I ended up having a four square um, up in Waipu, when I, you know, right at the end. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And I'd still be with foodstuffs right now if we're still in New Zealand. I, I, it was the closest to footy and the enjoyment I got out of it, of owning a supermarket in New Zealand, was the closest yeah. to being a rugby league captain. Um, yeah? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. I haven't, I haven't experienced anything like it since. Um, and that's truly the only reason why we left was because I wanted us to be close because we're in Sydney for 12 years. It's yep, all our yeah. families here in Queensland. And then we're in, you know, New Zealand for 13. So Joe and I had been away from our family 25 years. Yeah. Mm. I thought it's time, you know, we, we go home. And, and it's been amazing, mate. We've been back now sort of mid to late 2017. And um, Joe sees his sister every day, sees her mum, you know, every week. I see my mum every couple of weeks. She's up in Toowoomba. Uh, my sister... You know, I see and my brother and uh, it's really, really awesome. So I've really got to thank New Zealand in so many ways. Joe did a teaching degree over there. Yep. And she was never you, thinking of teaching when she was. You, you she got was, a business degree, didn't you, when you were over there as well? I did my MBA. Yeah. yeah. When I was at the Warriors, yeah. So I did a Cert 4 in small business at the Bulldogs. And then when I went to the Warriors, I started my MBA through Southern Cross University, Lismore, by correspondence through MIT at Manicow. Yep. Um, so they'd send you a textbook and a folder and you'd have an assignment um, uh, after four weeks, another assignment after eight weeks, and then an exam at the end of the 12 weeks. And I did 12 papers yep. um, while I was still playing, which worked out good in a way because... You know, when I was at the Bulldogs, the Warriors was was such a tough trip. And I used to say to all the boys, and, you know, that's what the mantra we had was, it's our weather, it's our place. Yep. That's probably why Warriors went so well in Melbourne was because it was very similar. Similar, yeah. Uh, that none of the Aussie teams liked playing in Auckland. It was wet, it was cold. You had to go through customs. You had to get to the airport two hours early and then a three-hour flight. It was like going to the moon, you know. <laughs> and when I actually lived here and we had to do it every second week, um, you had to clean your boots every week. Yeah. You know, yeah. Routine. When you did, when you're at the Bulldogs, like you just go, this is a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's so many things that it taught, uh, taught me, but I was able to do study on the plane over and on the plane back. It wasn't what I wanted to do. The boys are playing cards and, yeah, watch the movies, but um, yeah, it gave me so much empowerment and um, and confidence because so many of the boys sort of thought 
being the player they were, they were going to get a job and get paid well, and they didn't. So yeah. that was a sort of a good lesson to learn before I retired. Yep. Let's go all the way back, mate, to your um, Warriors debut in round one against Manly in that yep. uh, yeah, 2005 season. You're appointed Warriors captain. Um, yeah. That must have been a surreal feeling, uh, leading the team out onto Mount Smart Stadium uh, as captain. Yeah, it was, mate. Um, the, the crazy thing about that, I didn't go to the Warriors with that in mind. No. Never mentioned that I was going to be the captain. I just assumed Rubes was going to be the captain. Um, but anyway, all stays. But when I was asked, I was honoured, and it was the toughest thing I've ever done. Yes. Um, and the only reason why I say that is when I was at the Bulldogs, I'd been there 12 years. So I'd been there longer than every other player that I was the captain of. Yep. So yep. I've seen all those boys come in either from another club or as kids. So I knew them really well. The only way I knew the players of the Warriors were as opponents. Yep. And um, because of my knee injury, I didn't get to play a trial game. Um, and I didn't get to do much training with the group. Uh, really only in the last week before that first game was when I was with the team. So I had five days to prepare for my first game as captain. It was at home. Um, it was amazing, you know, the reception we got and how cool everything was. But the thing I remember the most was, um, I don't know, I'd been watching the Warriors during 04, and they came equal last, right? So I sort of got an idea of how they were going. And um, they'd always go for the quick tap and go. But then they'd drop it in the first or second tackle. And I thought, yeah. if we're going to have anything to do with that place, we're not going to just take the quick tap. We're going to be yeah. okay. So we got a penalty and Stacey's run straight up. And I raced up and I stood in front of him and I took the ball off him. I said, no, we're going to take the two. <laughs> 11 out of the 13 players, or on one, 11 out of the other 12 raced up to me and started abusing me. <laughs> what are you doing? And I go, what am I doing? What are you doing? This is what we're doing. <laughs> no, we're not. We're taking the quick turn. Anyway, we had this massive argument. And I'm just going, holy dooly. Like, things are very different here. Yeah. Uh, we took yeah. two. Uh, I just felt as though it was a way to try and calm us down. Yep. And and sort of reset us and get us off the mark. When you're talking about get off the media, I just thought if we could get points, yep. then we seem to be all right. But if we didn't get points, the pressure started to mount yeah. and it started to be riskier and riskier. And I just thought we've got to teach them just to build it, you know? So anyway, that was a pretty quick lesson, really quick for both. The other 12 players and me. Um, but anyway, I think we lost by two that day, didn't we? Yeah, uh, so, I think it was, yeah, it was a close game. 26, 26 20 or something. 26 yeah. 20. Yeah, well, there yeah. you go. So maybe if I didn't take the two, maybe we might have scored an eight point try and won the game or drew the game. But... Oh, we, de we definitely would have. <laughs> <laughs> With the Warriors, yeah. these kind of things happen. <laughs> yeah. But I, I will say I, I learned a whole lot more as a leader during my time at the Warriors because it was such a different mix. Yep. Um, we had a young group, but we also had some really experienced players like, you know, um, Warringi Kupu, Lance Ohio, um, you know, Logan Swan, Stacey, um, uh, Clinton Torpy, mm. you know, Franny, um, Jerry C. You know, we had a whole heap of experienced players as well. One of the things I learned fast is that you can't be like, just because you've got a C beside your name, you're not the only leader. Yeah. You've got to empower everyone. And we had some great, like, Rube and Stacey. So we used to sort of say, you know, Rube would be in charge of the sort of Samoan um, boys and and some of the Māori boys and some of the Aussie boys. We had about 11 Aussies in our squad. Um, so, and then... You know, why Wairangi would be the Māori boys. Um, Stacey would be, Stacey and Lance would be all the shorter boys, no matter who they were. Uh, so it was just, like, so it was just it's, them two. Yeah. <laughs> just those guys, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but 
we had we had some really good guys who who got to the wide reaches of our squad. Yep, and had a lot of respect. A lot um, of culturally culturally different backgrounds going through. Hundred percent. And, and yeah. what I worked out fast was if one of the boys wasn't training too well or playing well, or and I generally I'd sort of have a word, but Rubes or whoever would come to me and sort of say, "Oh, so, you know, there's this. This is what's going on at home or wherever." And so you sort of get a complete different appreciation of what impacts the whole of life has on the players that I was playing with. Yeah. Um, also, how we learnt. Um, this isn't saying that the players aren't smart, but it just say that we learn differently. So the Bulldogs, if folks here would say, this is a move that we want to do, boys, um, and and just, walk, just talk through it, we'd be able to go and do it. But the Warriors, we talk about it, we show it, and then we do it, and then we generally nail it. Yeah, it, it was it was incredible. And my wife ended up doing teaching, and she just goes, you know, this is some sort of way of learning. There's a name for it, and I just go, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, you know, yeah. so uh, it was really really cool to learn all of those things that you don't generally think about. And even in the gym, like the boys were more worried about how much they could lift. Whereas I was taught by Billy was, you know, lengthen your limbs because they're rubber bands. You want them to be able to stretch when you don't want them to stretch. You want them to stretch. Yeah. Sorry, when you want them to stretch, you want them to stretch. Yeah. Um, and guys like Sonny, you know, like I always crack up. Sonny Fire, he'd be lifting stupid bench press. But they'd be, they'd be little halfies. I always called them halfies. I go, mate. You haven't got Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. Like they're long <laughs> arms. I go, so go the full length. I said, it's going to oh, hurt that way. <laughs> yeah. Go, no, bro, like I'm, I can do 180 bench press like three times. I go, mate, it's only one and a half you're doing. You're not doing three. <laughs> and he'd start giggling. Um, same with chin-ups, same with all those sorts of things. But oh, it was really, really good, mate. And, you know, I don't know whether you're going to talk about Sonny, but just to, yeah, we just to quickly we talk about there. Sonny, he was a, a kid who... His big smile and that. Um, he came as 18th man a couple of times in our first year and he roomed with Rubes and his energy and his and his presence. He was an 18-year-old. He's still at school. Um, and just his uh, um, youth, youthfulness. You know, he, he was so excited in telling everyone at school that he roomed with Ruben Wiki. And he'd tell us that story of how excited all the boys and girls at school were. Um, and that was him, you know, like, I, I used to have a party at the start of every year to try and get all the players together. Yep. And I'd have a theme, so it'd be, say, a P, so be a policeman and it'd be a dress-up. And we'd have a prize for the best dressed up. And then I thought, I'll add to that. So we had a prize for the best dressed, male and female. And then I had a karaoke machine. I wanted to get the voice because all of them think that they can sing. Yeah. But I had to have a price for that too because otherwise no one would get up and sing. So I had a little, yeah. um, I, uh, wasn't an I, a Nano, a Nano. Oh, I've had Nano, I, yeah, yeah. I've had Nano, yeah. <laughs> nano. yeah. And back then, a Nano was the coolest thing and they were really expensive. And I, I'll never forget Sonny coming up to me so the prizes that I had for the best dressed were longboard skateboards. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Peter yeah. Party used to get me those. Yeah. So I just thought they were a bit different and people liked them. And so the Nano. So I thought, this is really going to, you know, we're going to get this karaoke pumping. So anyway, Sonny comes to me and he goes, oh, bro, I really want that Nano. I'm going to I'm gonna absolutely sing so many songs. I'm going to just, <laughs> I'm going to win this, right? I'm going, okay, that's cool. So we have the party. Uh, oh, sorry, the party's going. And Rubes gets up about six or seven times and he's absolutely killing it, you know. Like, Sonny still hasn't got up and I'm thinking, far out, Rubes has won this already. Like, everyone's going to vote on it and they're going to vote Rubes. And so Sonny goes, okay, um, I'm ready to do mine now. And I go, okay, mate, what song do you want? He goes, Venga, uh, Venga, Bus, Venga, Venga Boy. Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> I said, all right, that's cool. So I announced, you know, Sonny, you're going to have your song now. And everyone's going nuts. Oh, this will be cool. He's, he goes, he goes gets ready to start. And he pretty much puts the microphone down and then lip syncs it and starts stripping. Oh. <laughs> he starts stripping and gets down to his undies and he's dancing. And all the wives and all the girlfriends of the players are going absolutely ballistic because... He had a rig on, like he's yeah, rude. Yeah. He was an Adonis, and he's just, oh, he's in his glory, right? He's absolute in his glory. And um, then when it came to the vote, obviously, the girls voted for Sonny. Yeah. <laughs> Hands down. Hands down, it's Sonny. <laughs> but um, that was the type of, you know, individual he was. Um, I'd always get a training early, and Sonny was always there before everybody. And he'd be on the computer because he didn't have Wi-Fi at home. Yeah. So he'd be <laughs> free Wi-Fi looking everything up, uh, <laughs> trying to uh, giggling to himself on all of the, you know, all the little mo movies or whatever that you watch, yeah. just cracking up by himself. And I'd be sitting there laughing at his laugh. But beautiful. <laughs> and that's why he's so sadly missed, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, I know I'm, we didn't fire a shot that year and we had Sonny's name on our chest and his number and we were playing for him, but it was sort of embarrassing on how he played. Um, but I think there was a 60 minute story at the end of the year and money was on there and they brought up a question. They were talking about everything uh, for the year and then <clears throat> um, money's laughing, you know, and he's got his gold teeth and just infectious laugh. And then, the lady asked him a question about the loss of Sonny. What impact did it have on, on you and the group? And Manu just lost it. You know, like, he was, yeah. you know, it was not coming out of his nose and he's just uncontrollably lost it. And I just looked at that interview and I just thought, wow, like, there's so many things that we actually didn't understand. We all struggled with it. But yep. deep down, you know, we are all like absolutely devastated and it didn't matter what we did or what we tried to do it couldn't get us out of that place um and it took the club really two years 2011 made the grand final in yeah. all grades um that's how long it sort of took and i'm not saying we got over sunny then but we sort of there were some changes you know learned to deal with it learned to deal with it um yeah. and he still remembered the 5th of January every every year, you know, and that just typifies him. He hadn't done anything over the, the sort of 10 days that we had over the Christmas break and he was worried about his skin folds when we went back. So he went to Bethel's the night before we started back at training. And you just go, oh, Sonny, that's not going to make any difference, man. <laughs> you know, but that was just the way he thought. And, um, yeah. For me, yeah. the most... Um, memorable thing, or yeah, about that time period was I can remember they interviewed you on um, on television, and yeah. the, you you were trying very hard to keep it together in that interview, uh, and you were still talking about him in the present tense, and yeah. they actually asked you, oh, you know, why why are you talking about him in the present tense, and you said because you know, as far as we're concerned, that he's going to be found is still here, but um, yeah, yeah, that that. I mean, I, we've kind of jumped away from from what we we're talking about before, but that that period at the club must have been a very tough period for you um, to to go through uh, as the captain of the club. Like you went through that that salary cap breach at the Bulldogs, you went through the the whole Port Macquarie thing at the Bulldogs. Um, you started the the 2006 season where they docked four points, yeah. um, you know, as and you were captain of the club. But this was probably the most uh, the, probably the hardest thing that you had to navigate through. Um, because yeah, of the well, surrounding it. And, the, and the hard thing was there was nothing that we could do that could change anything. No. Um, you know, and Ivan was Iv was uh, amazing and it really hurt him too. I, I suppose the hardest bit was um, just before we broke up, before Christmas that year, uh, so 2008. Um, so we went up to, um, right up, Cape Rianga up that way. It wasn't Cape Rianga, but it was up up that way. And um, we had a 
three or four day camp up there just before we broke up. So when we came back, we actually broke up. And um, yep. yeah, that, that camp was amazing. And <clears throat> Ivan asked us to write things down. And uh, he he actually told told us, I think it was the end of the 2009 season, that something that not haunted him, but, you know, just really sort of sat with him was we had to write all this stuff down and what we were going to do as an individual um, for the team. Yep. And um, Sonny said, I think his answer was, um, be the, I want to be, I want to leave a, I want to leave a legacy. I think that's what Sonny's answer was. I want to leave a legacy by what I do this year. And you now obviously he didn't get <laughs> to, um, to do that, to, no. to come back in the preseason. Yeah. Uh, in January. So it's, um, yeah, I, I actually got a tattoo after that happened and um, it's a sleeve it's right up there all the way down and um, anyway, Sonny's uh, sort of a big reason why I got it, uh, why I thought I should get one. Yep. Uh, I wanted something to sort of represent him and so I'd never forget him and that type of thing. And then my wife brought up a really good point. There's a lot of special people in my life that aren't, you know, alive currently, but are still present, you know, the way I think of them. And yeah. um, she sort of said, why don't you have something that represents that? And Sonny's a part of that. So I went and saw a guy in New Zealand um, and he did actually the Once for Warriors tattooing. Oh, yeah. Movie. Yeah, in here, in here, Taylor. And um, anyway, it took 24 hours to do this tattoo. I went three Sundays in a row over the February yep. you know, after Sunny went missing. Um, uh, eight hour sort of sessions. And during the whole time, you speak to a person, you know, a lot, about a lot, for eight hours. And he explained all the different patterns and representations yep. and different things. And it's my story and all of that. Um, and I've got a turtle that represents the spiritual side. And the turtle is set in Polynesia. There was, you know, man made a commitment with the sea that if, um, if the land took something special from the ocean, it would give something special from the land yep. back to the ocean. And um, India told me that they won't ever find Sunny. And I could never understand that. Anyway, my tattoo finished. And on the Monday after he finished my tattoo, he rang me early in the morning. And he said, you're not going to find Sonny, mate. And I go, okay, so how do you know that? And he goes, there's been a turtle just washed up on Muroi Beach, which is sort of one of the beaches not far from Bethel's, and it's the way the current goes. Yep. And he goes, yeah. you know, the ocean has taken something very special from the land, yep. and this yeah. turtle is a very old turtle, a big old turtle that is, you know, it's come up onto the beach and it's died. And he said, that is, that is the answer that you're not going to find it. And the centerpiece and of the my tattoo there. was a turtle. And the turtle yeah. was the one that washed up the next day after I finished my tattoo. And we've never found Sonny's body. No. And the turtle's pretty big in the Polynesian culture too. So It is. Um, yeah. So I was worried about it being, being like a plastic kiwi by getting this tattoo. And in here, explain it in a really good way. He goes, it's like buying Chinese, mate. You don't have to be Chinese to eat Chinese. Right. And I go, oh, okay. He goes, you know the story. It, rep it's, it represents your journey. That's right. It's, you know, I've got Celtic, which is, you know, I've got Scottish, English, and Welsh heritage. So that's the underlying. I've got Indigenous, which is my Australian side. Um, I've got Tongan, and Samoan, and, and Māori with yep. all of my you know, interactions obviously with living in New Zealand and all of the different, you know, the waves and the shark's teeth and the muka, you know, the, the kurus and all of that. Um, yeah, I've got four kurus on, 
on my uh, turtle, which is my grandparents, yep. and all of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's another, I suppose, reflection on my time in New Zealand and how special it was. I love that. I, I just love how candid and yeah. how, yeah, how how deep and emotional you are about this. It kind of makes all the football stuff seem insignificant, you know? Yeah, second uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's what got me there, right? So, yeah. you know, um, people talk about making decisions and, and the things that are unknown or unseen or, or not expected and the life experience. And we've got friends there forever. Um, yeah. Lifelong friends that will go back there and, and our kids have as well, which... You know, we couldn't have prayed for a better result. Absolutely. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, that's a fantastic story. Love, love to hear that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, the, the comments that are coming through just as you're speaking, the stuff that I'm reading here, it's um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of the stuff that we don't expect to hear. Um, right. you know, we, we get guys on here and, you know, they chat about their careers, but um, and we say it every time we have a live guest on. Each, each time we have a guest on, we learn something, uh, you know, incredible that we didn't know beforehand and yeah these stories just really make these i think um one of the cool things mate is like everyone sees what you do on the footy field yeah and so everyone knows that and it's you know it's on google or you know whatever um but then there's all of these other experiences like i know the first time i was welcomed onto a marae you know um that blew me away um we went down to Wairu, um to the army barracks and I couldn't train um, what the boys were doing, but uh, we got welcomed on the Marai and then learning all of the stuff, like no shoes inside and it's yep. a whole spiritual thing. And and there was actually a passing while we were there of one of the um, army guys' kids. Oh, okay. I think he committed suicide. So it was a really, really sad time. So we had to actually leave the Marai because the body was yep. going to be there and... Yep. You know, to actually get that type of experience <coughs> of being welcomed onto the Marae. And I remember looking at these three 11-year-old kids who who did the huck out more passionately than I've ever seen it done, I think, in my whole life. And I've just gone, my God, it means so much yeah. to these yeah. kids that they're welcoming other people, like strangers or visitors, onto About their, yep. their land. Yep so proud and passionate about their land and about being able to do that and oh, it just it was such an amazing way to be welcomed not only to New Zealand but you know my first experience um it was a lot better than walking around the field and the other experience I had put it that way yeah. <laughs> <It's Sunny Bill. laughs> yeah, oh yeah <laughs> of course I almost feel Feel strange going back to talking about footy now because oh no uh, sorry. yeah <laughs> yeah no that, 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 no no that's, no that's don't, don't apologize we, we really appreciate you yeah. sharing that with us that that's amazing it's like mind blowing to hear all that that kind of cultural experience that um you know you probably weren't expecting um going over there but um yeah no no thank you for sharing that with us we we, we love hearing this kind of thing. Absolutely, we do. Um, we, we always said that you should have been the recruitment manager for the Warriors because you obviously loved your time over there and you, you sort of um, debunked the myth that when Australians go over to the Warriors and that that's, you know, the end of their career. Retirement fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you, see, you seem to love your time at the club and, and you, you yeah, and I was stayed really there for 13 years. So, yeah. um, and I think, I think it's a little bit of the attitude you go with. If you go there sort of saying, I'm going to be here for two years and then I'm... I can't wait to get back to Australia. I think that's going to be, um, you know, I think one of the other cool things was um, actually when Brent signed at the Warriors, um, I'd played against him a number of times and I got to play with him for Queensland and Australia. But when he actually moved over to New Zealand with his wife and, and young family, uh, it, was, it was awesome to spend almost every day with him, you yeah. know, um, as I said, I knew him since he was three years old. Uh, I went to the Bulldogs when he was, I think, 10. So he was only a young kid, aspiring NRL player, but, you know, making all the rep sides, but still had a long way to go. And um, then to come over and play every week with your, with your brother-in-law uh, was really, really cool. And, you know, 
or he'd beard his house or he'd be at our house and we got so so much closer. Um, and he he enjoyed it because we'd been there for a year or two. You know, we'd been there a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So he he enjoyed being welcomed in the way he did because we knew where to go and, and and all that sort of stuff. And we knew a lot of people as well. So that really helped him and, and his family. But um, it's really... I, if you ever talk to Brenos, it's really special to him as well, his time in New Zealand. Um, and, yeah, he, he's similar scenario. He just wanted to get back to being closer to family. Otherwise, he would have still been there too, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I, I just – I got a first-hand – uh, realization of how well New Zealand does on the on the world stage. Yep. Um, you know, I went to this conference. They still have them, and it's basically Kiwis doing well overseas. What is it? What is it, Joey? The Kia Awards. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they're every year, and when you go to them, you're basically um, getting connected with all these people. And some of them are like the CEO of Nike in, in yeah. America and they're Kiwis or yeah. they're at Microsoft or like they're absolutely super talented. Um, and, you know, like the, the unfortunate thing for New Zealand, I suppose, is that there's so much talent away from New Zealand that are Kiwis instead of being in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the other things too that you don't realise until you're there is it's sort of the place where they test everything because yep. it has such that diverse sort of demographic and it's a, a good population size. So like the ATM and the cafes and, and all of that sort of stuff was all started in New Zealand first, you know? Um, and you sort of talk about it like, like as though you're a proud Kiwi, <laughs> you know, which, which I was, you know, super proud of everything that they were doing um, over there and, um, yeah, you sort of support the All Blacks when they're not playing the Wallabies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and all the other New Zealand teams, um, the Silver Ferns when they're not playing, you know, the, the Diamonds. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it was it was truly cool, mate. Um, and then to get uh, invited to be the, the Australian representative for the All Golds. I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah, that was... Yeah. Uh... I never really did the haka too much when I was in New Zealand and I got reinstated in 07 back in the Aussie side. Yep. We played the Kiwis in Wellington and I thought I can't sort of race off and hang out with Rubes in the week leading up to a test match against him to learn the haka because yeah. I'm going to start playing straight after the game and go to England. Yeah. So I didn't. And um, anyway, we won pretty well that day. Uh, in Wellington, I think um, Steve Maddow got sent off and yeah, uh, we won by 50 or something. I even scored a try that day. Yeah. But I had to leave really early in the morning with the boys that we just beaten yeah. on the, uh, to England for 24 hours, <laughs> however long it takes to get to England. Yeah. It was a pretty pretty quiet sort of plane ride. But anyway, I got to England and we got um, sort of a, a cab to the uh, bus to the hotel and then Bailey Mack, he was our um, cultural advisor. So he had to teach me the haka. So I felt like the wiggles, I'm doing the words and then I'm doing the actions. Yeah. I had sort of 20 minutes on each <laughs> and I had to get dressed up and on the bus to the um, the High Commission, the New Zealand High Commission you know, representative. And then we're on our way to Buckingham Palace to do the uh, haka in front of the Queen. Queen. At Buckingham <laughs> Palace. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was the first time I'd actually properly done the haka. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fire right there. <laughs> just a, I love my cup of teas, and we just had a cup of tea with the Queen and um, and the Prince and, you know, Philip. Um, and, oh, my God, then we had to do the haka, and I was so nervous. And Rubes has lost his voice. He's that into it. And all the boys, Nigel Wagner, and all the boys ripped in, and that was amazing. But um, when we finished, the Queen sort of, you know, we went back to the, the Queen and said, oh, what do you think? And she said, oh, that was incredible. It's the first time the Huckers ever been done in Buckingham Palace. 
And then um, she said, but you, you were a little bit different to the other guys. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, I'm Australian. <laughs> I could tell that was something a little bit different. But um, they've got like 200 staff at Buckingham Palace and they're pretty much made up of New Zealanders and Kiwis. Oh, really? Yeah, right. They're all like watching on the staircases above us with the corkies and <laughs> Prince, Philip, <laughs> Prince Philip and the Queen were watching us while we're sort of down in the entry as you walk into where they go, you know, um, into this huge sort of halls on the other side of the wall. But we're in that area where we did the hucker and these stairs come from where they came down. And there's all these Kiwis and Aussies standing around like, you know, um, just looking at the guys doing the haka, it was, it was incredible. Um, and then to play the game, we had to do the haka at Leeds train station because that's where it was done 100 years ago. Oh, okay. So, um, I was standing next to Tommy Tupo, uh, Gary Tupo. Yeah, yeah. Um, Craig Eastwood, I think, was going to lead this one. And so he was doing the slap in the legs. And he goes, ah, and I thought it was going to go, ah, come at you like that. So I started <laughs> going, come at you, and I started doing the exit. And he did me, went, ah, and he did something else. <laughs> Stitch up. <laughs> he was standing beside me. He lost it. He's trying to do the hacker. And he couldn't because I'm rattled by then because I just, like, I was the second time I've done the hacker. And I was oh, no. bad. Luckily, I was in the back row and yeah. I couldn't. Oh, but it's peak hour, Leeds train station. <laughs> and we did it before the game. And then we did it after the game. Because uh, it was Stace's last game. Stacey's That's last right, it was too, yeah. 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 So four times I've done a hacker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I can't say I've got better at it. But, um, yeah, I, I, I got a full appreciation of what it actually means. Um, whilst I wasn't doing it the way the other boys were, I actually get a real understanding now of being an opponent. I was a, the opponent of it, you know, many yeah. times, at least 10 times. And I'd always look at, um, you know, Brent Webb or Stacey because I wouldn't look at, wouldn't look at rooms. I wouldn't look at, <laughs> I was like, Luke, they're intimidating, man. Yeah, that's scared the shit out of you. <laughs> I'd always look at Stacey because I'd always start giggling looking at Stacey or I'd look at Brent Webb because I'm like, you're an Aussie, you can't do the haka. Yeah. So I'd, look at him. I'd just keep on contact with him. But um, once I actually did it, then um, I'd look at Isaac Luke or, you know, you know whoever it might have been or I know do, do it really, really, really passionately because I understood what it means, you know, how important yeah. it is. I'd actually get energy from that, which... I sort of switched it around instead of it being a, a negative, a hard thing to know what to deal with. I actually took it as being a positive way to, you know, go into a game. Well, yeah. your, your Warriors club form leading up to 2007, um, there was there was a clear um, improvement in the performance. So 2005 was a bit of a disappointing finish to the season. Uh, 2006, obviously, we had the salary cap, the docking of the points, which put us a negative, but we we had actually had a pretty good season in 2006. Yeah, we missed out by four. Just missed yeah. out by four to <laughs> Parramatta. Um, yeah, yeah and, and 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 you yourself had a really good season that year as well. And then and then we built we built into 2007 because there was um, we built off that strong finish. And um, yeah. 2007, you know, obviously we make it back to the finals again for the first time in a few years. And um, yeah. You, Speaking of tries, you 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 you're a bit of a try machine in 2007. The first two rounds, you get you get meat pies, and then you yeah. score you score. Seriously, you're going to have to hand in your uh, membership to the front rowers club because you score one of like a 50 meter try against Newcastle. <laughs> yeah, um, that, you, you've got to remember got to, that try. I thought I got to 70 meters. No, <laughs> 70, there was a chip and chase in it as well. I think as well, wasn't there? Uh, you know what? The only thing that was going my way that time was Steve. Steve Stimson was was chasing. Was, that's <laughs> right. all, all the wingers and that thought. I think I think they thought he was going to get me. They didn't even worry about it. But um, yeah, that was. I was a bit tired after that. I think I actually went straight off after that. I couldn't couldn't play on. But all I remember after I scored that try. I got replaced and I walked up to the bench and Rubes was there and he just hugged me and I just 
I almost collapsed on him. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a pretty phenomenal year that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I think was it the Cowboys that beat us? Um, yeah, Townsville, Townsville that, Heat, um, and they made us wear the black jerseys. We had to wear the black jerseys. Yeah. See that 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 was really hard for me, right? Um, I used to get a bit upset about that whole thing. Um, we we did our captain's run the day before at the same time we played. Yep. It was a beautiful yeah. breeze and it was a nice, really nice day. And the boys are going, oh, sweet, as it's going to be like this. We're beautiful. That's awesome. Anyway, we get to Townsville, uh, we get to the ground on game day and it was hot. It was real hot. Oh. And there was no breeze. And when we got there, even the supporters, we're walking through the supporters and they're all going, oh my God, how hot is it? <laughs> I'm just saying all of our boys like humming like and they go, oh bro, it's so hot. And I'm going, no. Oh, and then this whole thing about wearing the black jersey, I'm going, it's just material. It doesn't make it hot. Like it's actual Cool Max. Like it's made of Cool Max. Like, so it's called Cool Max. But anyway. It's a psychological uh, advantage. Oh, yeah. And then, and then when we went out to warm up, like they almost did like a tunnel for us. And as we're walking through the tunnel, everyone's just going, oh, God, it's hot. <laughs> like, just trying to play this head game with us. And by the time we got back in after the warm-up, the boys, are, they're gone. I'm just oh. going, oh, like it's it's hot today and the boys aren't going to be able to handle it. We were never going to win that game then. <laughs> we were Michael, never destined to win that game. Yeah. When, we, when we spoke to Michael Lark about that, he said he was filthy that they made us wear the black jerseys that day. Oh. It's honestly, oh, I'm surprised I can't say because of all of all people, he should know it doesn't matter what color you wear, mate. Oh, it's just material. Yeah. Like it's not going to make you hotter. The, the week make- before that, though, the the home semi final that we got because we finished in fourth spot in 2007. That must have been massive for the club at the time, having that home semi-final against the Eels that night. Yeah, it was, mate. And and I was a real disappointment. We had so many opportunities to win that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and that would have that would have really propelled us towards where we should have been. Um, by losing that game, we lose our home ground advantage. And we, you know, and we've got to play the Cowboys in Townsville and yeah. sort of boom boom out. But um, yeah. I don't know. It was it was it was such a big night. Like the crowd was massive. It was a really big game, and I think this isn't bad against Logs. But the only thing I remember is Logan Swan late in the game dummying to was it Kirky? Was it Aiden Kirk on the Aiden wing? Aiden Kirk on the wing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Someone was on. It might have been Skinny Burns. Someone was on the wing, and he dummied to him. And he got held up or he got dragged down on. It would have been a dead set try and we would have won the game. But anyway, I'm not blaming Lays. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, We've I'm all been doing that for years, so you don't have to. Yeah, we, we've been doing it. <laughs> it's like a bit of okay. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> Mate, going into 2008, um, we'll fast forward. We we finished in the top eight. We scraped into, into the top eight, finishing eighth. And we have to travel to Melbourne to play the, the minor premiers in Melbourne. Um, we've heard some quite a few stories from Michael Luck and, and Michael Witt about the build-up to this game. How confident were you guys going into the game, obviously, with that McIntyre system, having to play the, the might of the Melbourne Storm in Melbourne? Yeah, well, Melbourne had a really good home record uh, during that period, especially they called it the graveyard, but at uh, Olympic Park. And... Um, we, we had probably the best or the most success out of any of the NRL teams down there. Yeah. And as I said to you before, we, we talked about our weather. Um, you know, this is our weather. Well, that was what Melbourne was like. And when we played in Melbourne, we always got a lot of – there was a lot of Kiwis in Melbourne. So there was always very high support in Melbourne. So it was almost like a home game anyway. Um, yeah. And we did really love playing Melbourne. Like, the Warriors loved to play in Melbourne. I don't know why, but just love playing against the Storm. I think, obviously, because they got such a good team. And um, so many Kiwis played for Melbourne, too. Matty Ruhr and yep. Journey yeah, and, right. you know. To wear a nickel. Yeah. Nickel and all of them. So, there was a whole heap of that, too. So, we were confident. And everyone had written us off because Melbourne were unbeatable in Melbourne. 
So uh, that was a good thing for us. Did we say anything about what was said to him after the... After no, we, I was just going to ask you, what did you say What did you say to Wit after that try, after really? that try? I was yelling. I think I was back on the, like, the 50. I was yelling from there. <laughs> Like, seriously, what are you doing? He goes, I'm just putting the clock down. I said, putting the clock down doesn't matter if you don't score it. Jeez. Oh. Oh, God love him. That was an amazing try and, and a, an amazing sort of half year. We, we started the year pretty yuck as yep. we were yep. good at doing. You know, we usually win one of our first five. And then we get to halfway in the year round origin time. And then we go on a run. And I think we won 10 out of 12. Yes. 10 out of our last 12 to sneak into the semis. Sneak in, yeah. Literally and, on um, differential, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, to play Melbourne and Melbourne, we couldn't wait. Yeah, that was a bonus for us. And to play Melbourne, we love playing Melbourne. And, um, yeah, we went really good. And, mate, the week, that was, an, that was a memorable week my Warriors time. The week after that was another memorable week because how much airtime the Butcher was getting that whole week. Oh, yeah. Want to sell the ground, like sell the ground out, wanted to sell out. And then the big photo of him with the sell out sign, you know, outside yeah. of Mount Smart. He loved that. Um, and it was amazing, as I said to you, walking around for the coin toss. And I think we were down, we were down about 10 or 12 nil early. <laughs> Yeah, 13 6 at half time it was. Yeah. Yeah, we were down pretty early. We were down, I think it was like 10 0 after 15 minutes or yeah, something. They got a couple of quick tries, a penalty. Yeah. Early, and yeah. then we were able to sort of like fight back a little bit. I just remember, I think it might have been off a scrum and um, Sammy Parrott made a break. And I was able to be one of the players. I wasn't the only, but one of the players to drag him down. And uh, that was only because I broke out of the scrum quickly. <laughs> it wasn't because I was fast. But, um, yeah, that was incredible. And then, obviously, the week after, we came up against Manly, who um, they they timed their run really well. It was like playing them week one of the comp. They were fresh as a daisy. They were well prepared. And they did a job on us. Like, we were... I think that sort of 13 to 14 week period had caught up with us, um, you know, and, and they were next level manly and they obviously went on and did the same job mm. to Melbourne in the grand final. So we obviously hadn't taken any cast blood. No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but, um, no, it's, it's, um, they, were, they were really well prepared and they had, they had a really good footy team. Um, they had rested up. They, they used that week really well. And uh, we were battling out with other teams. Um, but it was amazing to get a home semi after we finished eight. Yeah. Th yeah those yeah. two moments, the Melbourne game and then the game afterwards, I mean, the, you know, the Ruben Wiki on Soliola moment, the Selak oh. crowd, the blackout and everything. Those are two of the greatest moments in Warriors history. Like, no, none of us will ever forget that. And it must have been a really proud moment for you to have been. Yeah, it was. And, yeah. and I suppose to see the whole country... Yeah. Be so much behind the Warriors, you know. Warrior I'd, fever, yeah. I'd heard about it um, during the O2. Obviously, I was yeah. at the Bulldogs, but I'd heard about it. Um, and they were sort of saying, there's no other time other than when the All Blacks are in the World Cup or when there's America's Cup here. Yeah. And I was just going, oh, okay. And I thought, I hope I get to experience that. And it was incredible. Um you know, I remember going to other parts of the country after that season and you go to, down to the South Island and stuff and people would recognise you and want to talk about rugby league and you just go, I've been down there a few times and no one's wanted to talk to me about rugby league at another time. <laughs> Even though you knew what it was. But that's that's how, you know, how empowering, I suppose, the Warriors can be and how passionate Kiwis are about their sporting teams. That, that hit up that Ruben did where he um he took out uh um, Viola Sparta. <laughs> no way. I could hear him on the Was he screaming Sparta or Spartan or something when he was running I don't the know, but he was screaming something. I could hear him <laughs> on the other side of the post. And you know how big the crowd was? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So oh mate. 
And that was inspirational. Like, yeah, that sort of stuff lifts, you know, everyone. Yeah. I just That's remember even, even watching it on TV, the roar when Aiden Kirk takes that intercept at the end there and scores that try. Uh, even yeah. through the TV, like watching it back here in Brisbane, it was just the atmosphere was unreal. Oh, man. Yeah. Mount Smart Fall is one of the best places to play footy. Yeah. 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 Mount Smart Fall and also Belmore Fall. Yeah. Like the, the fans are so passionate and they're so one eyed. It's so good to be on the home team. Yeah. Um, when you're not on the home team, the best thing you can do is play really, really well and hope they don't play well so the crowd's quiet. Yep. It's deafening, but that doesn't happen much. <laughs> Mate, we, um, we spoke about the Sunny Fire tragedy earlier. Um, yeah. Coincident, or, you know, you end up playing your 300th game in that round one game against Parramatta in 2009. Nine. Nine, yeah. um, that must have been a really, um, a day of really mixed emotions for you, especially after what the club had just been through. Yeah, it was. Um, there was something I always dreamt of doing. Like you saw Jeff Gerard do it. I was a Parramatta supporter as a kid. And when I saw him do it, and it was just, wow, how old this guy and how many games he played, you know? And then it became a sort of a big thing. And, when you got that close, um, I would have loved for a Sonny to have been there. You know, that's that would have made it super, super special. But um, I don't know. It, it might have helped take a little bit of um, a little bit of your mind away from the absolute hurt. Yeah. Uh, the family all come over. My mum and my sister and brother and you know. In-laws, they all come over for it. It was, it was a really big celebration for us as a family. And uh, Bobby Linder came over. The club uh, found out he was my idol. So he presented, my jersey. he presented my jersey. What's that? Did they give him some chickens? <laughs> no, I didn't. Double I didn't. chips. Yeah. They, yeah. Is there a big rooster in New Zealand? I don't think so. But, um, yeah, so he... Um, he presented my jersey, and that was that was really special. And um, yeah, we won. I think. Yeah, you did. Yeah, we did. I don't know. I don't know whether it was that game. There was a game where Rubes was in doubt. I think it might have been. Oh. No. Rubes had retired. Rubes didn't play two thousand nine. Yes. Right. Was this last year? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I. You know, I. I, I remember this. Rubes had a rib injury and he was trying to play. So he, he um, it was a captain's run and he had to do a fitness test to be cleared to play. Anyway, his fitness test was he had to run, he had to run at someone and tackle him. He had to run at someone and he had to tackle him as well, right? So I was the, the stupid one who was the one who had to be the one to get tackled and run. And so I'm running with a pad for him to hit me and he's gone and hit me and he sort of flicks the outside of my finger oh. and broke a bone in my hand. Oh. And oh. I've, just, I've gone, oh, and Rubes has gone, oh, I'm sweet ass. And then the doctor <laughs> goes, yeah, you're good to play, mate. And then I go, oh, I think I just broke my, broke my hand. <laughs> no. And then the doc's gone, what? And I said, I think I just broke my hand. I said, oh, I felt something crack and it's not real good. Anyway, he looked at it. He goes, yeah, I think you have. And luckily, I was on the outside. So I just iced it all night and he just jabbed it. And I got a brace and wore a brace. So yeah, it's better on the outside because the brace sort of keeps it there. It quits, oh, yeah. but keeps it there. You can't feel it. It's you know, a needle. But um, if it's in the middle, it's a lot harder because it moves up and down all the time. When you Anyway, yeah, I remember that. That must have been 08. Um, yeah, during 08. I, I didn't miss a game, neither did Rubes. So we, we're both lining up to get the needles before games. <laughs> <laughs> him, and he's getting it because uh, he just, he's just crazy self. But. It's 2009, though, keeping up with your try scoring feats that we've been talking about all night. I was at a game at Brisbane against the Broncos where you, you uh, jumped through double. the air and caught a. You got to try double that day. Yeah. And you yeah. jumped through the air and plucked the bomb. And um, scored a try. I'll never forget that. Thought you played yeah, on so, Wednesday or something. <laughs> so um, I'd only just come on the field. Like I'd been off 
and I just came back on and Stacey put a bomb up. So I'm fresh as a daisy and I just followed through. And poor old Josh Hoffman, I think it was his first or second game at fullback and a 36-year-old front row has jumped above him and caught it, <laughs> <laughs> caught it over him. You thought you were mining. Uh, <laughs> uh, apparently the boys, the Broncos boys, absolutely give it to him um, for the rest of the year. Like, you know, you got out jumped by a 36-year-old front row. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was – I think that was the only time I ever scored a double in a game. That is. I, I scored a double in an origin, but they bloody disallowed it. Yeah, 2007. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, that's right. So I was a bit, bit cranky about that. Um, but, yeah, that was pretty cool. I, unfortunately, we lost the game. We yeah, scoring no, a double, but we still lost nice. the game, um, which it wasn't, it wasn't that good. But it was always pretty good playing at um, Seabus against oh, yeah, the Titans because uh, we'd always have a lot of New Zealand support of the three-quarters Warriors yeah. and one-quarter Titans and then at Suncorp, it'll be three quarters Warriors and one quarter Broncos um, and then in Melbourne as well. So you get some parts of Sydney that were a bit like that, but mainly those sort of places, certainly the New Zealand supporters or, you know, New Zealand citizens who live in Australia getting behind the Warriors um, really, really helped. It was, it was really cool. Was it ever uh, like conflicting emotions whenever you played against the Bulldogs, having spent so many years there? Yeah, um, the first couple of times I played, and then after that, I was injured nearly every time we played them. Um, it was it was it was very different the first time, um, and then after the first time, I was sweet as. Yeah, I think yeah. I think say if there was eight times I should have played, I think I only played about three, and I think. I think when I was at the Warriors, the Warriors you know you beat us every time I played for the Bulldogs. And then when I was at at the at the Warriors, I think the Bulldogs nearly beat us every time I played for the Warriors. Yeah, they had the wood over us for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was always a little bit um, sort of confused. I'm obviously a Queenslander and I moved to Sydney. So when I played for Queensland in Queensland, all the Queensland supporters loved me, but when I was in New South Wales playing for Queensland, all my Bulldogs supporters hated me. Yeah. When I was playing for the Bulldogs in Sydney, they loved me. But when I was playing for the Bulldogs in Queensland, they didn't love me. No. I went to the Warriors and I was playing for the Warriors in New Zealand. That was cool. And when we were in Australia, some places it was cool and some places it wasn't. Then I was playing for Australia in New Zealand and it's probably, it wasn't as cool. And then when I was <laughs> playing for Australia in Australia against the Kiwis, it was, it was cool. But I've got to say... Um, it was pretty cool one testing at Mount Smart. Um, I was on the field before we did the national anthem and they announced my name and the crowd went nuts and it was the first yeah. time I'd ever heard. Um, any New Zealand the crowd goes, time. Yeah, yeah, crazy yeah. for an Aussie player. So that was pretty cool. And they also went nuts for Brenos. Uh, went for yeah. Dady as well. So, right. yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty special um, how people, you know, welcomed us and, and looked after us, and and then to get um, um, nominated for the New Zealand, you know, um, order of merit. Yeah. yeah, like it blew me away. I thought when I received the letter, I thought I was one of the boys gene up. So I rang up the number that was on the letter, and it was the Beehive, like it's Wellington. <laughs> and I'm just sort of saying, I've just got this letter, and I'm just ringing up to see whether it's true or it's false, and and. Um, she goes, oh, no, yep, someone's nominated you and would you like to, you know, accept it? And I go, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like, I'm blown away, you know. Um, so, yeah, I accepted it and it was a, an incredible mum come over and my wife and kids were there. We were at um, Government House in Auckland and uh, had a whole ceremony and I was pretty embarrassed but because I'm sitting there and I'm beside all these people who have been, you know, in community work, like volunteering for 40 years. Yeah. Just blown in in five minutes. I've been there six <laughs> years. Getting an, a, you know, an, a, an award or recognition for contribution to rugby league. And I'm going, and these guys are absolute legends. And I'm sitting beside them. So, but it was really, really cool. And the whole process and ceremony and, and recognition was 
was very, very special. Mate, you play down your role as an Australian for what you did for rugby league in New Zealand. It was like, you know, as we said, it was a massive signing for the club when they signed you. And then the way you led our club through those um, seasons that you were there and, and captained us, it's, it's no surprise that someone nominated you for such a prestigious award. It's, um, oh, it's always you. been renowned that, mate, you're, you're the New Zealand's most favourite Australian. It's, um, it's always been that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I um, had my testimonial, I, I wanted to invite the two prime ministers and Kevin Rudd was the prime minister of Australia at the time. So I invited him and he said, I'd, I'd love to come. I just got to obviously see as it gets closer. And um, John Key, prime minister of New Zealand, yep. straight away he replied and he said, absolutely, I'll be there. And I, um, Kevin ended up getting sort of overturned before it. So Julia sort of overthrew him. Yep. Um, yep. And Julia sort of said no, that she wasn't going to come over, which is fine. Um, and John John attended, and I just thought he'd sort of be there, show his face and go. He was there for the whole the whole lot, which blew me away. And he actually did a speech, and that's when he said what you just said. Um, and I, I was bawling. I, I couldn't believe that the Prime Minister of New Zealand actually said that about me, you know. Um, I, I wanted Ray Warren to be my MC. Um, Ray sort of said, the only way I'm going to do it, mate, is if there's a Channel 9 game on Friday night in New Zealand. And so he's known how hard that is going to be, right? Oh, so I'm on to David Gallup, like week <laughs> one. I'm going, we're playing the Broncos. I need the Broncos versus Warriors Friday night on this date. And, you know, David sort of said, oh, we've got to wait for the TV and all that. He ended up um, confirming it earlier than what it normally gets confirmed that it was, right? So then Ray's in the shit because he doesn't like flying. He hates flying. Yeah, that's right. He's sort of going, oh, yeah, okay, yep, no worries. It's getting closer and closer. He pulled out two weeks before it. He oh. goes, I seriously can't do it, mate. So then we're trying and trying and trying to find who we could get. And in the Queensland team, Mal had brought in different people to be managers, team managers and stuff. And one of them was Ian Healy. And I got to know oh, Heels. Yeah, yeah. So I rang Heels and I said, Heels, mate, would you do me the honour and be my MC for my testimonial? And he goes, I would love to do it. And he came over and I thought, how great, because everyone that's there will know him because of cricket. Cricket, and yep. Legend, and the Kiwis would, you know, think highly of him because there was a pretty good period of Australian cricket that he was a part of. Yeah. yeah. And he just started straight away unleashing on the whole Kiwi thing. Oh, and, really? Uh, everyone, but everyone was laughing their heads off, right? Talking about, you know, the old um, underarm bowl and oh, yeah. bowl out, <laughs> over, over and all the stuff. <laughs> so it got everyone, it got everyone in, the, in the mode. But Rabs did a little video um, cross, but John Key was outstanding. He actually did a half an hour chat. i um, oh, sorry, a speech. Um, in my testimony, it was incredible. Yeah, it's loved, really cool. loved by the country, Absolutely. mate. Um, just going back to footy, in just that 2010 season, you end up with a, a bit of a heel injury, I think it was, which ultimately keeps you out for the se whole season and forces you into retirement. Um, must have been a disappointing way and a frustrating way to finish what was such a wonderful footy career. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, I, I hated missing games, so. What I did at the end of um, 2009, I had this heel injury for two years. So before every game, I'd have to get a, um, have to get a, what do you call it, to deaden it? Needle, anaesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. Anesthetic, yeah. yeah, into my heel. Yep. Before every game. And so that would really hinder my training um, because you couldn't walk for a couple of days after the game and then, to get right to be able to play again. And then when it was Origin, it was even worse um, to be able to back up for the Warriors. So I sort of went and saw our doc and I said, like, I was going to retire in 2010. So that I was going to retire one more year. And I wanted to have a really good year. And I wanted to get this operation so that I wasn't dealing with that every week. So what they did was cut some bone because they said that soft bone had grown. So my bursa was always irritated. So that's yep. what the pain was. 
So um, they cut the bone away to try and reduce the irritation on the bursa. So when they did that, that all went successful. But then I got golden staff. So then um, I had to have another operation to cut away all the, obviously, golden staff ate away some of the bone. And there was scar tissue in there, so they cut that away. And then I tried to come back again and then um, tore all the scar tissue and all that. And then I was never going to be able to play. I was out for another eight weeks or something. So then I had another operation and then just announced that I retired. It was really hard because my whole career, if a doctor said I'd be out for eight weeks, I'd want to be back in four weeks. Yep. Um, and every time I tried to get back early, it would make it worse. And that really, really, I really struggled with that. And um, so 2010 was one of the worst years of my career, but it was also the best year in another way because I think if I had played that whole year and had a good year, then I probably would have wanted to play again. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of finalised it for me. And you see so many guys play too long. And some people might say that I did. You know, my body was telling me that I did. But, but, but you had the form just, on the field. No one gets golden stuff, you know, meaningly. Yeah. So it was just a freak thing that happened at the hospital. So that stuff happens all the time. Um, I reflected on my career. I was lucky to have got the games I got. Adding those games on makes it look better. But at the end of the day, I was blessed to have had the 16 or 17 year career I had and um, all the people that have been a part of it um, were really, really special, right from family right through to friends and, you know, teammates and opponents and the whole bit. Um, yeah. You know, I, I loved every moment of it. So, um, yeah, a little bit scary in retirement, I suppose, when you're talking about this whole CTE and, and things like that, um, I did get knocked out a lot. And, um, you know, you sort of seeing the studies that they're doing, it's something that we won't find out until after. Yep. Um, they're trying to do a whole lot of stuff to find out before. But um, I was a part of a study at Newcastle University where I did some testing. Um, and then I've got to go back and do more after so many years. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I wouldn't change a thing in my career. I, I loved every moment of it. Um, even the stuff that I learned, we talked yep. about the origin. Yep. Um, you've got to learn those the hard way sometimes. And, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how I end up in years to come. But... Uh, I was aware of it when I started. So, you know, I knew uh, I'd looked after myself as best I could. I went to the chiropractor at least once a week, sometimes twice, sometimes three times if I was yep. playing Origin, yeah. and that was my maintenance. Um, I know that your life lasts a lot longer than your rugby league career, so I wanted to make sure that my life after footy was going to be as good as it could be. Um, yeah, not knowing what we're learning now at the time is – a bit scary, but I can't do anything about it now. And I'm glad that they're doing the stuff they're doing now yep. to protect the future players. Um, yep. Particularly with so many women playing now and at such a high level, um, you know, I'd hate to see any woman have some of the scenarios of the guys that we've seen with dementia and, you know, Parkinson's and um, made a neuron and yep. all these things that, I sort of connected back to being knocked out, you know, a lot yeah. and just staying on the field. So, yeah, I don't want to go on a down buzz, but yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. the other side of what we do. Yeah, exactly. It is. Post, post footy though, was there ever a pathway discussed with you to get into coaching with the Warriors? No, no, it wasn't. I suppose one thing that I'm a little bit disappointed about myself, the reason why I did my MBA was – was to be in more administration. I wasn't wanting to be a coach, but when I was in New Zealand, after I retired, my wife and the principal at Mags, at Mount Albert Grammar, convinced me to coach. And I absolutely, I, I had a ball. I coached the first yeah. 13 at Mount Albert Grammar and we, we made the national final. We got beaten by Kelston. Um, and then the team that I had was Satili Tupanua. 
Oh, yeah? yeah. Ilya is in my side and Nathaniel Roach. Um, yeah. Yeah. And in that sort of age group um, was Bunty Afoa and Brad Abbey and all of those sort of guys were playing in that comp. Um, I really, really liked it and sort of got me thinking about, oh, maybe it's something that I do want to do. But I sort of still stuck at the whole administrative type thing. The thing I'm disappointed about is not getting into the club and starting to go through that administrative start, like process. And I, I sort of wish that the NRL identified people that, that were wanting to do that and created a pathway that would be best suited to be, because we do lack leadership in our game at club level. Yep. Um, it's one thing that Wayne Bennett even, you know, he sort of brought up only on the weekend. And I just, I think we've we've got that real tug of war between business savvy and former player or, or rugby league savvy. And if you can have the combination of both at a high level, that's, that's a massive bonus. So I was wanting to be that. Um, I got my opportunity last year. And it didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, so I had to scratch an itch that I had forever. I was a GM of footy at the Bulldogs. I always wanted to do that role. It was great that it came up at the Bulldogs. Probably timing wasn't right. Um, internal maybe politics. Was, maybe it was just the wrong club, mate. Maybe you needed to be yeah. at the Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> internal politics was was really big last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably the sad bit about it. But anyway, I, I gave it a go. I learned a lot, a lot, a lot of lessons last year. Um, and I'm not doing it now. It doesn't mean that I won't ever do it, but um, I've actually gone back to my childhood pre-policeman and building. So in March, oh. I... Um, started my mature age apprenticeship as a carpenter. Beautiful. Welcome oh, to the club. <laughs> oh, is that where you are? <laughs> nice. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, no, absolutely loving it. So, um, and from a mental and a well-being perspective, health-wise, yeah. uh, really, really good space. Um, I'm training every day. And as you know, it's a very active job. So, love being outside, love being up and down ladders and active and um, really, you know, uh, taking off the kilos, getting back to playing weight and feeling good again, um, even though I'm a bit older, but uh, it's something that I'm passionate about and I'm really, really enjoying. So, And it's a learning. great skill to have, mate. It is. It's a it's a great trade. It is really, really yeah. good. Mate. I've always renovated my houses, but I was very good at the demolition part. Yeah, the most expensive part is putting it back together, and I couldn't yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't, now, you weren't one of these guys though that would take out walls that were load bearing, not realise they were load bearing, and then they. Uh, I'd ask the builder. <laughs> I'd ask the builder, and I'd take out absolutely everything I could. <laughs> I'd say, "Not that wall ago, okay." So I'd remember that and take out everything else. Mate, um, sporting prowess obviously obviously runs in your family because you've got Jamie playing netball for the Giants, and Riley's on a development contract at the Cowboys at the moment uh, for yeah. 2022, 2021, yeah. 2022. Um, you must be proud of the careers that you, your kids are forging in their own um, sports arenas. Yeah, I am, mate. I suppose during my footy career and, and even their uncles, Brent, yep. uh, they saw all the good and the bad. Um, so they were very aware of, you know, what they were getting into, I suppose. And you just love your kids to do something they're passionate about. Um, Jamie had, as I was saying before about my school and junior coaches, some great coaches in New Zealand um, who were just outstanding and she really learned a lot. And and then, you know, to play so young at the uh, Waikato Bay of Plenty, yep. drive it down when she was still at school at Mags for training. Um, and then Jules, obviously, Julie, it's Joe went over to coach, um, you know, Magic and then, Took Jamo over to the um, over to the Giants, so uh, she's loving it, mate. Um, she's doing really well. Yeah, we're really proud of her. She's got a mum's um, netball ability and 
and aggression and all of that sort of stuff all in one. So um, she's a great kid. And then Rosie, um, yeah, he's he's learned a lot in New Zealand as well. Uh, yep. Played played restricted, uh, just like Nathan Cleary. Yep. When we're in New Zealand, so many people said, you know, kids in restricted don't make it, but that's that's not true at all. So, you know, I, I don't know what they'll do here in Australia, but I, I reckon it works in New Zealand. Um, and it certainly worked for Riley, and it certainly worked for Nathan Cleary. Nathan, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, they're not struggling playing against men now. No. Uh, they've been able to mature and become bigger people and still, you know, um, increase their skill set. So, Riley's really loving it in Townsville. He started his um, electrical apprenticeship, but yep. uh, now he's full-time training. So, he's had to put that on the back burner. And, and my second daughter, Case, she's going down the nursing path, but she loves her sport as well. So all very different. Um, and we're a blessed mate in New Zealand. You know, sport's really big there and the schools that the kids went to were really good sporting schools. So they were able to play sport at a high level and, yep. um, yeah. and really enjoyed it. And now they're doing it full time. So we're very, very lucky. Casey um, commented on the live feed, mate. She's sent a comment through saying, who's your favourite child and why? <laughs> the three of them as I said to you before it's like state of origin they're all very do special. any of them live at they're home? I know any... uh, Case was but she's just moved to Sydney so Case oh, is yeah. actually oh, okay. dating uh, oh, sorry Melbourne Case is actually dating uh, Tyson Smoothie oh yeah. yeah from the Melbourne Storm yeah yeah, yeah so they were up here and you now they're back down in Melbourne um, so she's back down there doing a the nursing and, um, yeah, so Case is the one that always brings up that question. <laughs> we love our children equally, and uh, they're all very special in their own way. Is she a middle child, by chance? She absolutely is a middle child. I, I feel her pain. Yeah. <laughs> she's Joey Jr. Joey's the same, my wife. Yeah, she's a middle child as well and carries on as well about that. I'm the eldest mate, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, Pricey, before, before we let you go, um, yep. I'm just going to ask you some quick quick fire questions that we ask of all of our guests while, yep. while uh, Hammer here quickly uh, checks out some of the uh, questions from our viewers. Who was your toughest teammate? Toughest teammate? Well, I reckon Jonathan Thurston. I reckon to play the way he did, as long as he did at the level he did, I reckon Thursday. Awesome. Who was the most professional in regards to game preparation? Uh, oh, I'll probably say Tady. Uh, having to come back from four knee reconstructions, I saw what he went through and um, the state of mind he was in. And uh, he's a, oh, I call him a cactus, mate. Like he gets cut down, he just keeps growing. <laughs> Can't get rid of him, he's a pest. No, yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah, Brent. Interestingly enough, um, the other people who we've asked that question have all nominated you as the that person who's the most professional, most professional in regards to the game. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah mate. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I would never have thought that. <laughs> yeah. who, who's the best sledger? Oh, Ricky Stewart. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, Ricky Stewart. Oh, I've, I've seen guys run on the field coming off the bench and drop their head after Ricky's given him a spray. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away. Was, yeah, unbelievable. Who was the biggest pest? Biggest pest? Uh, biggest pest. Uh, you know what? I reckon Michael Ennis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, just... I, I used to get frustrated because... Like, he's such a good footy player. And I used to get disappointed with how he used to <laughs> carry on. But that's just how he, that's how he is, right? And Brent says to me, he's such a good bloke. Like, once you meet him, he's the best bloke ever. And I said, oh, I don't want to know him because I only know him as a footballer. And then when I met him, he's such a good bloke. And I'm just going, no, you can't be like a good bloke. I'm no, you can't be. No. <laughs> 
No, but he, he was, yeah, he, he never got under my skin, but to see someone like Petro and Nathan Hindmarsh lose it, who no one could get under their skin, no one could frazzle them, you just go, he's got to be good at what he does. Correct. <laughs> who is your toughest opponent? I, I go back to um, when I was younger, it was Glenn Lazarus. Like, I'm a, I'm a bigger body, and if I went high on him, he'd bump you. Oh, sorry, he'd run over you. And if you went low on him, he'd bump you. Like, his just body shape was so hard to tackle, and he was so athletic for a big guy. He had so much success as a rugby league player and really skillful and fast. And So I'd say he was probably the toughest. I, I found him hard. Um, and this other one that I was only thinking the other day was um, Steve Kearney, for some reason, oh, yeah. every time I played against Steve Kearney, he would come after me. Yeah. I don't know what I did wrong to him, but <laughs> he would just be off, so he'd give penalties away just to bash me. Like, I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> Joe Wagner. Joe Wagner was always hard. We, we, oh, had him, yeah. we had him on a few weeks ago, yeah. And, uh, Joey? Yeah, yeah. Joe Wagner, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And mate, when you talk to him now, he's a big bloody marshmallow. Yeah, oh, isn't absolutely. he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How could he hurt anybody? Um, who was the best trainer that you played with? Best trainer? Um, well, there's, there's guys who, who would do whatever, like get on the grog and be able to back up and train. Um, and then there's others who... Yeah, that's a hard one. Probably, probably Thursday. He's just really competitive, mate. Yeah. Like, you just couldn't beat him in running because he just kept on trying to run harder. Yeah. It showed uh, in, his, in the way he played, didn't it? Yeah, he yeah it did. Like, he couldn't breathe. Never, still never gave up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd probably say Thursday. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I have to think about that, but probably Thursday. Okay, awesome. What about the team comedian? Team comedian. There's plenty of blokes who, who wanted to be, um, <laughs> who'd like to be, but there's always guys that, that were funny. Um, oh, you know what? The one that I, I really did like was in Origin was Chris Close. Oh, yeah, and he Choppy. Would, yeah. yeah, Choppy. And he would get Shane Webke, Gordon Tallis, and Wendell Saylor, like throwing Gatorade bottles full and empty at him every bus trip. <laughs> and he would be sitting there in two front seats and Choppy would be on the microphone and they would just be relentless, just pegging stuff. He'd say, duck boys, so we'd be ducking and they'd be just coming out. I don't know how they didn't hit the bus driver, but <laughs> Choppy would just have the best one-liners and just absolutely give it to all those boys. Um, Queensland legend, Choppy. Jace, Jace Hetherington always had some really, really good yeah. one-liners and real dry. Um, love telling jokes. Um, yeah, no, that's... Um, then there's other guys that are sort of pranksters. Uh, I'm trying to think of... Did you ever play with Nat, Nat Wood, Nathan Wood? No, I didn't, but heard massive stories. <laughs> <laughs> Hippo, yeah. Niven and... Campo told uh, us a great one last week, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that mask? Yeah, the, yeah, the mask. string mask. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no. Georgia Gaddis was a bit of a trickster. Yeah, yeah. We heard to, he, he got mentioned as well. George Gaddis he used to like yeah. having a bit of fun. Uh, Lucky, Lucky's got a little bit of a little bit of a kid side to him. Um, yeah, uh, that's probably. <laughs> yeah. What about the worst trainer you played with? Uh, Flatty Matteo. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. <laughs> Uh, him and Chris Nan, Chris Nanu. Yeah. Oh. Chris Sandow. Yeah. No, no, Chris, Chris Nanu. Oh, Chris Nanu. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The two blokes we got, Not we got here in 2011, yeah. 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 Got them at the same time. Yeah. yeah. No, those two. Right, mate. I'll, um, I'll scroll through some questions. Which current player do you find exciting to watch? Um... Oh, geez. Young Welsh has been pretty good to watch, hey? Hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, the last few weeks. Um, 
Uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, uh, uh, Isaiah Yo's. Uh, I'm, I'm a real fan of Isaiah Yo. I think his development, he's become a real player. Um, real footy smarts. You know, you had Jake Trevojevic and um, uh, Cameron Murray, who, like, before the sort of six to go rules, were really killing it skill wise and, you know, um, defensively and that. But I think this has really brought Isaiah Yo into it and the way that Penrith play. He probably touches the footy just as much as Nathan. Yeah. Um, and is probably just as important as Nathan. Takes a lot of pressure off Nathan, actually. Um, they're the sort of players that I really enjoy. I really like Sam Burgess when he was at his best. Yep. Um, before he went to rugby. Um, tough, quick, mobile, skillful, mm. outstanding. Um, there's some, some good sort of younger players coming through. Uh, I thought Tino started the year really well. Uh, he probably looks like he's struggling a little bit with the, the origin and the week-to-week -week expectation of back-to-back mm. -back stuff. I, I, I don't know if he's a middle forward. I think he'd be better on an edge. Yeah. Yeah, well, they certainly didn't buy him as an edge at, at, the, yeah. uh, at the Titans. Um, yeah, I am a real fan of a few, few, fair few of the players. I, I can't think of the ones at the moment. I'm just trying to go through. You know, Isaiah Papali. I think oh, yeah. is, he's, a, he's shown yeah. as a sort of a costly release, you know, from the Warriors. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I really enjoy watching the kids like Welsh and those sort of guys. And then, and then you obviously, your, your middle forwards, the skill-wise of, of those guys. Um, Tommy's playing outstanding at the moment. Yeah, Tommy he's Boy, he's a freak, is, isn't he? He's on a different That's planet, um, which is good for Manly, not so good for the Bulldogs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Speaking of the Bulldogs, when the Bulldogs play the Warriors, who do you go for? Uh it's a really hard one. When I was actually at the clubs, obviously, for the club that I was at, yeah. um, since I retired, I go for both teams every week until they play each other. And um, now that I'm not employed by the Bulldogs or on the Bulldogs board, I, I just hope the best team wins. Um, yeah. I'd probably sway to the Bulldogs only because I was there longer. Yep. Um, but that's the only reason. Um and, and I was there from 18 to 30. Yeah. And then 30 to 36 yeah. of the Warriors. But both very different experiences and very special experiences. And both clubs are very special to my heart as well as my, my family's. Mm. Um, my brother stayed a Bulldogs fan. Everyone went to the Warriors, but the Warriors were the second team. Yeah. Um, you know, my kids are Warriors and Bulldogs fans. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah, um, it's good to have two clubs. Yeah. I, I I grew up as a bear. I played junior footy for the Bears, and my brother and sister were Manly supporters, and yeah. they used to, they used to come to my uh, footy games dressed in their Manly gear when I was playing for North. So arch yeah. rivals, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> arch rivals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you answered this one, but someone's asked, "Who was your hero growing up?" Bobby Lidner. Yeah, Bobby Lidner. Yeah. 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 Uh, what was it's your most Steve Waugh. Steve Waugh, from, oh, yeah. from a leadership perspective, I just thought what he was able to do during his career, career was outstanding. His teams were able to isolate individuals. Yeah. And I, I, I've seen a few rugby league teams do that, but not a lot. Um, we, we did a pretty good job at the Bulldogs um, during sort of the 202 to 04, but there were some other teams that were doing it pretty well at the same time. So um, we had a pretty good team. Also, not a yeah. bad bench. You know, Sonny Bill and Thurston yeah, and Ray exactly. Satasi. Yeah. Uh, your most, what's the most memorable moment in your career? Oh, uh, yeah, it's so hard. I, I sort of go origin and test footy is more of an individual one. Yep. And then obviously your club ones. Um, so I, I go <clears throat> the, um, the Storm game 
the semi final for the Warriors. Yeah. Yep. But the Bulldogs, <clears throat> you know, 95 and 04 were truly amazing nights, but also the 02 game against Brisbane. Yep. Um, um, the Aussie one, I'll probably say the 07 game, whilst we, we beat New Zealand pretty well, that was a really hard slog to get back there. And Ricky was the coach and he he believed in me again. Yep. Well, he believed in me to come back into the team, which felt really special. Um, and then from a Queensland one, I'd probably say that uh, that 2006 game, game two, yeah. just because if we lost that game, that was my last game. It was gone, yeah. Um, I went and shaved my head because I was pretty upset um, the night before we had a guy come in and talk to us and sort of had, not had a go at me and Petro, but sort of said what New South Wales are saying about us. And I was pretty disappointed. Anyway, I rang mum and I said, what should I do? And she goes, well, what did you do when you were a kid? And I said, I just love playing footy. And she goes, well, be that, that little nine-year-old kid again. So I went down to Brisbane Mall the next morning. I got my head shaved, level one, all over, like I did when I was a nine-year-old kid. Yeah. And I went out and had a ball. Yeah, so that, probably that game. Nice. Um, with your kids growing up in New Zealand, do they call them jandals or thongs? Um, I think depends on the company. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if they're New Zealand fun RM, then they'll call them jandals. If they're Aussies, they'll call them thongs. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, who was the biggest influence on your career? Oh, that's really hard. I'll, I'll probably say... Um, my mum would be the standout. Yep. Uh, mum, and then it'd be those coaches I said, Arthur Wrigley, Billy Pollard, and um, Greg Platts, and then uh, Peter Moore and my wife. So I probably got six. Okay. Who have had huge impacts at different times, but yep. unforgettable impacts. Yeah. Uh, and talking about the current game, what are your thoughts on the current six again rule? Um, I think it's okay in parts, but I still think a penalty needs to be given because teams are just willing to give an offside. Yeah. And it's really one tackle, but the team that gets tackled can't build momentum from the offside. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a penalty, you're kicking out and they're actually attacking. Yep. And they're in good ball rather than still trying to get off their try line. Yeah. That's why Penrith is so dominant because yep. they're smart giving the penalty, well, the six to go away at the right time. And then once they get in a good ball, they, unless they, 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 they can defend the try line, but they try not to give it away. I will say a quick thing. My biggest gripe in rugby league, the chain, the rule I want changed is the dropout from when you go for a penalty, kick a goal and you kick it dead. Yep. The 22 meter drop, like dropout. There's yep, no other yep. part in our game where you get two bites at the cherry. Yeah. yeah. So you kick for touch and you don't kick it out. You don't get it wherever you think it's going to go out. No. Yeah. Right. So why can you take the option to go for two? And if you miss and it goes dead, you still get the ball back. Yeah. I, I don't, I've never understood that. And I've brought it up at the rules to get changed. And it's never been changed. And I, I still don't understand. It doesn't happen much in our game, but why do we have a rule where you can have two bites of the cherry? Um, one last question before we let you go, mate. Um, when are you going to apply for the role at the, as NRL CEO? No. I've seen what I go through, man. <laughs> that's a tough, tough job, mate. No, that's a tough, tough job. What? Like I saw David Gallup during that whole salary cap scenario, I, I spent a lot of time with David on phones and yep. and you sort of got a real appreciation of what their daily job is. Mm -hmm. And then I'm pretty good friends with Toddy Greenberg. So I regularly spoke with Toddy and he didn't have the bet, like he didn't have a, a smooth ride. No. No, he he's, he's a really smart guy. Um, doesn't matter how smart you are. The politics can come and get you too. Um, and then, you know, uh, Mr. Abdo, you know, he's he's from a very different background. Um, 
Yeah, no, mate. I'm looking to build. Um, <laughs> build my apprenticeship. I'm a, I'm a go for it at the moment, and I'm hoping oh, to be yeah. a be a licensed builder at some stage. Smart man, mate. Before we let you go, I just want to read something out that um that uh, probably most of our viewers probably might not have heard before. And it's just when you were awarded the 2011 uh, Member of New Zealand Order of Merit, uh, the, the citation that they uh, gave in response or in recognition of you, um, and it pretty much sums it up. It says he began the role as captain following the club's worst ever season, and helped rebuild it to become one of the league's best. He played a mentoring role to less experienced players. In 2006, he led the team with honesty and integrity while it was investigated by the National Rugby League over salary cap breaches. And in 2007, he was awarded Captain of the Year and Proper of the Year at the Dallium Awards. Mr. Price has been described as the most loved Australian in New Zealand sporting history. Mate, we just want to thank you for everything you did for Warriors footy, um, everything you've done for rugby league in general. Uh, as we said to you before we went live on air, mate, this has been an honour and a privilege. We are like two little kids when um, when you responded to our message to say you were going to come on. Uh, it's been an absolute blast for us to, to chat with you. And um, we have a saying here on Ruin Hammer that um, whoever's played for our club is forever and always. And uh, you, Steve Price, are forever and always Warrior 121. Oh, thank you, guys. And sorry to be... A marathon, you're going to have to split up into seven different episodes. No, not at all. Not at no all. way. We said it's... to you, you could, the floor's yours. You speak as much as you want. No, I just want to, yeah, I'm just sorry. I just want to echo those thoughts of, of Mark and say it's been an absolute honour and a privilege to talk to you. You you change Warriors history forever. Um, you're forever etched in Warriors history and you're always in like the conversation of the greatest Warriors of all time. And Absolutely. just thank you so much for your time and everything you've done for our club. Thank you, mate. No, it's it's uh, it's honestly it's a it's a privilege to be a part of that history and and the family, the Fano, um, and yeah, I'm just hoping to get over to New Zealand at some stage in the near future, just to be able to catch up with all the friends and and uh, and our families that we um, you know, obviously got to know pretty well over there. So, with my one two one, it was actually a little bit of confusion when it first came out. I was given a different number. One two three. Yeah. Yeah. But then um, what happened was they realised because I was captain on that day that they had to switch it around. Yeah. Because yeah. so, we, we originally had you listed as one, two, one, two three, three, and then I did a bit of research and found out that it's actually one, two, one. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm glad it's one, two, one because I've got a tattoo with one, two, one on me. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs>